Hello and welcome to another edition of Send It Mate Podcast. I'm Caleb. I'm Josh. And I'm Couchy. And I reckon we're just about as excited as we've been <laughs> for a while. Yeah, a long time. <laughs> because <laughs> for today's episode, we have someone who we've been following for quite a while, watched all these videos on YouTube, love his work. He has swayed many people in their decisions <laughs> to purchase multiple products in the hunting community and the shooting community. And let, let's face it. Uh, in the shooting community, you buy one thing, you just want to keep spending money. It's a sure. very expensive uh, habit suit. <laughs> but um, yeah, so tonight we've got Aussie Reviews. How are you going? Very well, guys. Great to uh, be with you and uh, appreciate the opportunity to have a chat with you all. Well, thank you for coming on. <laughs> Our pleasure. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, yeah, I, think... I was actually going to add, you know, if, uh, if I'm the most exciting thing that you've had on the show for a while, you, that doesn't say much about your show. <laughs> <laughs> oh, we're talking to these two knuckleheads every week. Is that just <laughs> exciting? Well, all right, then we won't talk you up. Bloody hell. <laughs> <laughs> no, well, it is It is exciting. I mean, it's the be actually one of the best things is you, you, you're thinking about buying a firearm or a piece of kit and you're sitting there going, oh, I, I kind of want some genuine review and feedback of someone who's actually used the thing, not just a salesman in a store. And obviously yeah. they've got the agenda of trying to sell you the thing so they can make a profit. So yeah. it's the best thing to have a first-hand review of someone who knows what they're talking about firstly. So, I mean, I guess that's why we're excited. Definitely. Yeah. And the, the, the fact that you're not biased uh, in your reviews as well. You just – yeah, and you say this on your channel. You just, you know, say it how it is. Uh, and that's helpful because you actually helped me in my decision to buy a ticket A one tactical over the rigor precision. <laughs> yeah, <Many years>, right? <laughs> yeah so, man, good choice. They're they're a really great rifle, and I've got a number of friends who have done the same, and they just absolutely love the thing. I mean, I think I'm well, thinking back now. What was it like using that Winchester ammo? I think it was uh, through that, and notoriously, I've never had you know good results with Winchester. And that thing was shooting like 0.3 of an inch, five shots out of the box, you know, at 100. And it's like, well, what more could you possibly want? Yeah, yeah. <laughs> very true. <laughs> I think the other positive about you as well is um, we've all seen plenty of reviews from America and Europe and all that. Just having an Aussie guy that can tell you the truth. Yeah, yeah, that's it, mate. It's It's been a, it's a funny thing, you know, because um, a lot of companies have very much tried to, I guess, uh, muscle in on what I do. Um, and I've had a few falling outs with uh, some of the major companies here in Australia where um, they've dropped me or I've just walked away from them because I just won't be swayed, you know. Um, just uh, along the lines of, oh, we saw this review. Oh, I don't like how you uh, referred to our ammo in it is, um, you know, not accurate. Well, yeah, that's how it worked at the time. So, yeah, just that sort of stuff. And uh, that's why I just stay clear of them as much as I can. Um, and you know, just get basically sponsored by you guys who watch me. You know, they're they're the guys who sponsor me at the end of the day, and then that way I'm free to, you know, review things as I want. I'm not, you know, I'm not held to any brand or anything like that. And it's just like as if you were seeing someone out the range who's got a product that you like, and you go, oh mate, what do you think of that? And then they just tell you their honest thoughts, um, yeah. and that's that's basically what I've done. It's nothing. You know, it's nothing sort of ingenious. It's just how it normally would be if you saw someone at the range. Mm. I think that it resonates with a lot of people. I think Aussies especially in that it's a genuine, open and honest review and you give the good and the bad. You're not just pumping something up. Um, yeah. If you don't like it, you don't like it. And I think that's where people go, well, hey, this guy's telling the truth because he said, you know, these things are good, but this is bad. So yeah. um, <laughs> you, you think that the companies out there that, that have those queries, you think that the constructive criticism they'd be able to build and, and better their own product from, if especially yeah. if someone on the ground, boots on the ground doing it, uh, and you're just saying how it is, surely they can go back and go, oh, we've got some improving to do. Let's work on it and yeah. make the product better. Yeah, mate, I, I have had a couple of companies like that where I've reviewed a product and uh, they've gone, no, not fair enough. Um, we take that on the chin. That's really good. And then they've actually said to me, oh, would you mind – you know, doing an update, um, we're going to go away, back to the drawing board, improve those things. Um, you know, would you be happy to do another review? And I'm like, yeah, no problem. 
Then you have some people, though, who uh, carry on like children and then uh, badmouth the living hell out of me. Um, <laughs> we all know where I'm going with this one. And, um, and uh, suggest that I don't know how to clean a firearm and, and suggest everything else. Um, and, uh, you know, yep, there's other people who have bought the same firearm having exactly the same issues who have sent the same <laughs> issue on video to me to say, hey, mate, I'm glad you called it for what it was because I'm having exactly the same issues. So, you know, and, and those people who go out of their way to badmouth me and everything, well, really, mate, let's be honest, um, they're just going to do themselves an injustice because, um, you know, the consumer isn't stupid. They look at that sort of stuff and they go, geez, do I really want to be dealing with a company that carries on like this? Um, or a company that turns around and says, hey, we've taken it on the chin, we're going to make some improvements. Would you uh, care to have a look at the product again? Um, and then I do. And then people are like, wow, geez, isn't that some great customer uh, you know, support? Like one of them recently, like that big horn armory, the 454 uh, Casul. I mean, man, I was so disappointed, you know, like four, was it four and a half thousand dollar lever gun? And, you know, I couldn't even cycle the ammunition in it. And all it was was, um, you know, they basically put the uh, loading ramp in for a, a four, I think it was a 460 Smith & Wesson. So it was only a slight little bit of a difference, you know, but it was enough to, to uh, you know, obviously make it malfunction. Um, the guys at Bighorn, um, you know, who was a friend of mine's rifle, and um, he got on to them like, this guy just did not stuff around. He just went, give us your address. We will express post out the parts for you. Um, and on top of that, we will pay an armour in Australia to install it, fix it all up for you, and please accept our apologies. To me, man, that's a, that's customer service. Um, yeah, you know, yeah. um, and and that's what any person who's spent four and a half thousand dollars on a firearm would expect. Um, no joke. So, <laughs> <laughs> so yeah so once again like i said in that you know pretty disappointed that it didn't work out of the box but in saying that i can't fault their customer service there and then once it was fixed yeah ran like a dream um and you know it was just reviewed exactly as it performed for me at the time that that's it nothing more nothing less yeah yeah i guess uh as bad as the first experience was with it being great customer service, you'd probably go back to them again, sort of regardless of the first experience. Yeah, hundred percent. I mean, that that manager had also explained to a friend of mine that um, you know they've identified the fault at their factory where that that has happened and how it's happened, and you know whether that be I don't know the nitty gritty of it, but whether it be a parts, you know, bin next to the parts bin for the four five four and the four sixty whatever they've put into place a new procedure there. That's what they've said, and it will not happen again. You know, so like, I mean, like they couldn't do enough, you know, yeah. um, and, and especially being international, normally you get just forgotten about with these companies. But, uh, you know, I take my hat off to them for that. Um, you know, fantastic. I mean, what more could you want? Yeah, it's an inconvenience, but not only are they getting everything to you that should be there, but paying, you know, whatever the bill may be, uh, for a local armor to install it all and fix it up. So, yeah, it's great to see that sort of customer service still exists. Mm. Yeah, yeah, sure. 100%. So do you have a lot of companies reaching out to you to do the reviews or is it more you drink yeah. by yourself? Yeah, mate, a bit of both. Um, in the beginning, there was a lot of companies that would reach out um, and what they basically would do would be kind of like buddy up to uh, try to get you to review a lot of their stuff um, and in a roundabout sort of a way, I guess, sway you to be along the lines of what their promotion is for that particular product. And then it'd be, well, no, I want to use it as this and I'll be shooting this ammo through it. Um, you know, some companies um, would prefer to see ammo that they import um, fired through the firearm only uh, because obviously whichever one shoots well, will the person will go and buy that. You know, um, things like, for example, one one company uh, didn't like the fact that I used optics that wasn't uh, sold or imported by them. And I've gone, well, you don't pay me. So, it's, <laughs> you know, it's, it's up to me to use whatever optic that I like. Yeah. Um, you know, so things like that, there was a lot of that 
in the initial uh, years I found. And then I just moved more and more away from it where I thought, well, I don't I don't need these companies. Like I'll just go and buy the stuff or if I've got a mate of mine that's bought a new firearm and wants me to have a look at it, I'll, I'll just go and have a look at it that way. I'll just change up the business model a little bit there, so to speak. So, and that's all I did. And, um, you know, but even now I still get... I still get uh, sponsorship offers come through um, a lot from optics, you know, torch manufacturers, all that sort of stuff. I just, I'm just not interested. Um, you know, I don't want to tie myself down to to one product. Um, you know, and even one of the one of the major uh, torch uh, suppliers here in Australia that I was doing a lot of reviews for. I mean, look, I'll tell you now, they even uh, they even offered me uh, a discount in the sense of for every torch sold from my review, I'd end up getting like uh, you know kickbacks from it. Like it was about ten percent, something like that, from memory. And I refused, and they were like, "What? You really?" I'm like, "No, I don't want it." Like by all means, you can give me a discount code for my viewers, so they can go and get stuff at a discount. But I'm not interested in your money. Um, and I think that really sort of in today's world that confuses a lot of companies because they're like, everyone's got a price. Well, no, they don't. So, um, you know, and and they get very shocked with that. Um, But at the end of the day, like I said before, you know, I touched on consumers aren't stupid. Like um, people have followed me long enough and they know what my general likes and dislikes are. So if I started promoting something excessively, um, and especially if it was (laughs) pretty uh, cheaply made and, and not of good quality, like the guys watching me at home would just go, hang on, this isn't, this is how Aussie normally does it. Like what's what's going on here? So that's it. At the end of the day, as long as I've got breath in me, I'll continue to do the reviews as I see fit and I'll just fund it myself and also with the help of, you know, you guys who watch me. So that's it. Perfect. Yep. Well, I think that's probably the best way to remain unbiased and mm. that really does come through. So again, yeah. well done and uh, kudos to you for doing all that. Yeah, thanks. I have to ask because we're on the topic of, of your channel. Uh, how did it, how did that come about? The channel. Mm. So, mate, what annoyed me in the initial stages was if I wanted to buy a product, yeah, you, know, you jump on YouTube like most people do, and this isn't just firearm specific. This is just products in general. But in particular, what annoyed me about firearms products was that you'd have people doing like an unboxing. Um, and then they wouldn't go out to the range or any, and, and shoot it, you know, and you're just like, oh, yeah, okay, it's nice to see what it comes with, but I want to see what it gets used with uh, and how it shoots. And then you'd have other videos where there was no unboxing, but they were just shooting, you know, at targets and there was no real groups, there was nothing done. And I thought to myself, I've got to, like, this is frustrating me so much, I've got to bring this together and um and be thorough with it so that for the people who love the specs you know the real geeky guys and girls out there that love all the specs there's something in it for them with the desktop uh review but then the people who just want to see how the damn thing shoots and with different ammo that we can get over the counter here in australia well there's that as well but then on the flip side of it too it was uh uh it was designed around being just fed up with the lies and everything that I saw in the media about uh, shooters and shooting in general. And I thought to myself that this is this is so far removed from how it really is. You know, they just get that smidgen fraction of like what point something of a percent, um, you know, of firearm use being criminal use compared to licensed shooters. And they just really promote that in such a negative light. And I sort of got, I guess, really sick of seeing people react in a very negative way when I bring up the fact that I enjoy shooting and I just think like hang on like why would you be why would you be sort of tainting me with a the brush of a criminal so you know that was the other really driving factor with it as well that I wanted to promote it bring more people into the sport and grow the sport and the hobby whether it be from a feral pest control point of view a recreational hunter or a target shooter or a collector or whatever i wanted to bring more people into it and grow that and also get the information out there on what was really going on nice yeah nice um with obviously starting youtube how long did it take before you realized there was something going to come of it 
Uh, probably in the first three months, um, it went from basically just being, okay, I've got a little bit of time now on, on the weekend to, to be able to review something that I like to requests. And then those requests grew. And then all of a sudden there was that many, I couldn't keep up with them. Mm. Um, and in the initial stages, like I remember uh, my partner at the time, <laughs> You know, we were having a discussion about saying, well, geez, you know, like this is sending us completely broke. And it was just the pride in me, even though people would say, you know, start up a start up a, uh, you know, a donation system. Because back then, before Patreon, there used to be a donation system directly on YouTube. And I, I just couldn't do it. It was just the pride in me. I thought, no, no one's going to want to donate to me or anything like that. But, you know, it was the cost of running everything was just tremendous, um, you know, especially when you start doing a long distance review. Like usually you're firing about 100, 150 rounds of ammo. Um, so, you know, if you're firing that like 308, 300 wind mag, you know, like look at the prices of it now. Like it's, you know, you're looking at 250, three bucks a shot. So um, it soon adds up for doing a review. So I guess... Um, you know, in the initial stages, that was where I started to go into, okay, you've got to listen to what your fans are saying. And they're saying, hey, we want to be able to help you out because we see what you're doing here. Um, let us help you. And then I thought, okay, I just got to do it. And then I did it. And then it was like, wow, okay. And then I had the, had the, uh, I guess, more funding to be able to do more requests. And then it just grew and grew and grew. But then it grew to such a stage where I thought, okay, I'm going to have to drop back now um, and start focusing more on YouTube because it was growing and growing. But then what happened was it was when Google had pretty much enforced a lot of their new rules on YouTube. And then overnight, you know, I had, I don't know, what, 300 odd videos that were monetarized um, and virtually um, all of them were demonetarized bar about five. So they just cut cut me completely off at the legs um so you know something that was going from earning a couple of grand a month all of a sudden it was a hundred dollars a month so all yeah so then i had to look at the business model again so to speak and just go okay well how am i going to fund this and how i'm going to do it so that's when i started to go into the merchandise stuff to spread the word to get more people to come to the channel and stuff like that so a bit of a balancing act but you know i'm doing what i can do in the time that i've got does, has um, YouTube, have they continued to ban um, your reviews or have they sort of flexed up a bit on their, their rules? A uh, bit, bit of both, mate. They change their rules all the time. So, mm -hmm. for example, um, what you'll find predominantly is if there's a firearm that the anti-gun crowd don't like here in Australia, it will be demonetized or it will be banned completely. And I'll give you an example, the Remington 7615. Um, they banned that completely it was removed from youtube um it was uh what they have it down as i can't remember the exact wording but it was uh inappropriate material or something along the lines of that like i was doing nothing wrong in that you know like i'm i'm shooting a, a manually operated category b for bravo firearm yet here i am you know using the ruger sr 556 semi-auto 30 round magazines bang 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 you know no problem fully monetarized, everything's all good. Um, you know, and then uh, they did it with uh, Warwick, with the Warwick Arms review as well. And then they did it with the Oceana review as well. So it's like anything that's kind of cool and mm. uh, and the antis don't like in Australia, it just either gets banned or demonetarized. And the problem with demonetarizing is apart from obviously, you know, getting 0.3 of a cent per view back, and that's what the rate is, it's not much. but it won't come up in recommendations. So, you know, like people will be watching just videos in general. And if you've got a whole heap of demonetized videos, they just don't come up as recommendations. So people just don't view it unless they specifically put in that uh, product into the search field on YouTube. So, mate, they, they do absolutely everything they can to try to stop you. Mm. Does that take just one person to report it or is that something that sort of needs a certain amount of people to actually have an issue with it? Well, mate, it's more algorithms. Um, yeah. You know, like uh, like I'm a big fan of uh, Tom Gresham's gun talk in the US. I've been listening to him for years and he said many years ago about this was coming and I thought that, that 
surely that's impossible, you know, but I see it. Like every month I lose about 1,200 subscribers. They just take it away from me. And I've got a number of people who have said I've had to resubscribe for the seventh, eighth, ninth, tenth time. YouTube just keep automatically unsubscribing me from your channel. So where I'm at the moment, I'm only at, what, 66,000 subscribers? Mate, I should be well over 200,000, well over. Um, but That's what they do... So what they do is like I might get, say, um, you know, uh, 1,700 to 2,000 new subscribers in a month. But, yeah, they'll take away 1,200 to 1,500 somewhere there um, and just unsubscribe them on you. So, it's, you know, because well, so you... they oh, I've had to subscribe to your channel three times now. There you like, go. Yeah. Like I'll just be like because I'll, I'll search for your reviews. Nothing comes up in my feed. And I'll search for your reviews, and then I'll be like, "Well, wait a second, <laughs> I subscribed. Why isn't it coming up with notifications and things yeah. like that? Go back in, resubscribe. That's yeah, that's quite wrong. I thought it was just me not being able to work <laughs> my phone properly. <laughs> yeah, mate. No, it's 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 ridiculous. And when you see it, it's very frustrating. But um, they're trying to stop me on the principle of trying to cut off my money supply which obviously isn't going to work because that's not what I'm doing it for. I don't have sponsors and all the rest of it. So they're fighting a losing battle. I mean, I, I don't care if they were to demonetize every single video on YouTube. I'll just keep posting them. So yeah, yeah. Know, it make, kind of sounds make like, no difference. It kind of sounds like that YouTube sort of stepping over that line a little bit where it would almost benefit us to have another platform to actually use other than YouTube. Yeah. Yeah, a lot of a lot of people have gone to Rumble and stuff, but the problem is, is you, it's it's the web traffic. You just don't get the web traffic on the other platforms at the time, you know, that we're doing this interview naturally. Um, and I find that's a, a very frustrating thing because you know YouTube used to be an awesome platform, um, and I look get it. Like I completely understand. Like if there was someone out there carrying on like dangerously with a firearm and you know, and they were, say, for example, doing a whole heap of illegal modifications or, you know, promoting like, you know, criminal use of it or, or something like that. I, I, I get that. I understand that. But you guys, you know, you've seen the videos. Every single video is in compliance with all the laws. I'm licensed. Everything's registered. Like I'm following the anti's laws, you know, that they've got in in, in 96. Like I'm following them. So don't get angry at me following your system but enjoying myself, you know? Yeah. <laughs> it is yeah. super frustrating. That wasn't the plan. You weren't supposed to enjoy yourself. <laughs> yeah, that's right. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, you're not happy with the enjoying yourself. It's, it's amazing what they'll allow, what videos they will allow on YouTube at the moment. I mean, there's obviously, it's a different time in the world's history or at the moment. And... You know, we have all these uh, flamboyant people uh, and things like that that can just post up whatever they want, mm -hmm. whether that's in line with good health or bad health, uh, at no matter what age mm -hmm. as well. Um, but yet they're allowed to have their platform and their voice and do what they lot wish to uncensored. Yep. Yet we do when we're censored and we're following the law to a T. Uh, it yep. makes no sense in my mind. Well, I think that that's kind of speaks to the ignorance of the people who have a problem with things is they don't actually understand and they don't take the time to be educated and actually go, well, what am I looking at here? Is this in you know contradiction to any sort of laws or is this someone doing an honest open review, something they're allowed to do, enjoying themselves? Like, yeah, I don't get it. it it's It's such a massive contradiction and it's very unfortunate because a lot of people miss out for something that's you know not wrong yeah and then if we try to do that towards them or well, hell would break loose yeah and yeah yeah, <laughs> yeah. it'd be the world's ending <laughs> so it just wouldn't happen it's it's super not. frustrating anyway i think it's uh probably a good time yeah. to delve deeper into the man behind aussie reviews mm -hmm. a few questions of him aussie where are you from uh so you're talking about now or where i was born or where i've lived or both <laughs> Both. Whatever you want, share. All, 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 all <laughs> <laughs> okay, so uh, one thing that a lot of people don't know about me is uh, when I was in 
uh, when I was a teenager, I did some schooling in uh, Scandinavia. Um, so, um, and then I lived and worked there for a while. So, you know, Finland, Sweden, Denmark. Um, and, you know, I was uh, very much like I enjoyed, you know, doing hunting and stuff like that there as well. Um, I was born here in Australia, though, so I had no issues in obviously coming back here and, and things. Uh, at the moment, I'm, uh, I've got a 300 acre uh, cattle property. So, kind of my nearest town is Boona in southeast Queensland. So, um, it's uh, I'm about half an hour out of town. So, um, mainly because, yeah, if I bought a block in town, they wouldn't be happy with what I <laughs> I do. <laughs> I'm sure there'd be some complaints, but uh, but yeah. So, um, yeah, that's that's where I'm from, and um, you know, and. Yeah, I guess that answers the question. Well, it does, it's, and it's the perfect spot, I think, to do the reviews. And it's something that comes across. You sort of see your your range set up there, and I think all of us wish we had the same sort of setup. To be honest. <laughs> yeah. Well, officially, it's a siding in area because it's it would have a range that would have to be approved under the law up here. But so it's not a range; it's just a, a, a uh, siding in area, yep. all right. um, yep. <laughs> which it is to side in. Um, but yeah, it is good because you know I've just. Like the gully that I I uh, I side in at, like it's perfect. I mean, apart from a, a little bit of earthworks at the front just to level things out, it was sort of like it was made for it. And then I've got basically a you know a fair size hill behind it, um, you know, which would be a, probably about oh geez maybe about six hundred meters, you know, like thick so to speak. Um, so you know, it doesn't matter what you're using, it's not going to get through that. So. <laughs> but, uh, <laughs> But it is funny because if you look at like if I ever move my target at a hundred, you see in the backstop where I've where I've been sort of drilling away over the years, it, it's like a you know it's like a little tunnel like Ho Chi Minh City or something. You know, you see this <laughs> tunnel going through. <laughs> so I'm thinking to myself, well, I wonder if I'll ever get to the other side of the hill one day. But uh, yeah, it's only about probably I don't know half a meter deep at the moment, so that's pretty good over the last eight years. <laughs> yeah, you got a few decades more at least. <laughs> yeah, that's right. Yeah, I'm just, exactly. I'm just imagining you selling up and and uh, covering it over, and then in decades down the track, someone's sort of like, "What the heck's all this metal going on in the ground?" <laughs> they're, they're, they're prospecting. <laughs> they're like, oh, I've struck it rich. Uh, yeah, yeah, yeah they, yeah. they would have struck gold there. But, um, yeah. Oh, the way the way uh, copper is, the cost of that, um, you know, probably be worth a bit with what's sitting in there. Yeah, yeah, that's true. <laughs> What um was Europe like? Uh, doing some schooling in that. What 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 did you learn? Like basic, you know, out of twelve sort of school or, or yeah yeah yeah. So just like a senior year. Um, so basically, uh, made very different. Like the culture, the culture over there is extremely different. Um, uh, what I mean by different is you do get a lot more, even though they're socialist countries, a lot of the Scandinavian countries, very much socialist. Um, there's a lot of freedom in the sense of, you know, like it's accepted that, you know, you drink at a young age and things like that. Like, you know, you have like family get togethers and it's quite normal for, honestly, it's quite normal for someone who's 13 to sit there and have a glass, you know, a little bit of wine or a bit of beer with their meal, that sort of thing. Um, you know, I guess uh, as a teenager and going into my 20s, the uh, the best thing about it there was at least you could go into Burger King, which is, you know, Hungry Jack's equivalent over there, uh, or McDonald's, and beer was on tap. So, um, you know, so, so yeah, that was, a, that was a really good deal. So, you know, if you were a little bit too uh, intoxicated, you got thrown out of a nightclub, you'd usually see people going into McDonald's to finish themselves off. <laughs> <laughs> That's pretty cold. Beer on tap in, in Hungry Jacks. I couldn't yeah. imagine, to be honest. Yeah. What was so, the, uh, the the hunting like there? Uh mate, quite good. Uh especially uh especially in Sweden, you know, there was a, a lot of moose, um, that, that type of stuff. And there was really two calibers uh at the time, which was six point five by fifty five, naturally, uh, and thirty odd six. They were the two big calibers. Um, so, you know, most of the most of the homes in sort of some of the rural areas where I was there um, were all 6.5 or they'd be 30 odd six if they were going for something a bit bigger. Mm. Nice. Did you say, so, were you lucky enough to take a moose yourself? 
No, mate, never, never, never shot a moose myself. Um, but uh, yeah, other deer and things like that naturally. But um, yeah, never, never got a moose myself. Fair enough. Are the fallow better in Europe? Uh, to- in in what way? You're talking like just the general condition of them, and yeah, the size of. of- I guess the size of them, the condition, uh, the bloodline, things like that. Yeah, I'd, I'd say probably the big thing that I find a difference with over there as opposed to here, especially up here in Queensland, I mean, it's be pretty much the same down where you are, is we seem to have times where we go through a terrible drought, you know, so it doesn't matter what species of animal it is. I mean, geez, even your cattle, you go through some drought and that, and the, the condition on cattle can look, look a lot worse. And it's the same, obviously, with deer. Um, so what I find is in those Scandinavian countries, like, you know, you don't really have that issue because it's obviously it snows every year, you know, and then when the spring comes and everything comes alive and there's all the green, uh, you know, shoots coming up and they eat that and they're eating very well and, you know, drinking plenty of water and things where here I've seen some deer where, you know, they're not in really good nick at all. And it's because they've been in very arid and bad conditions where there's been a really bad season. So yeah, in that in that sense, I don't see it as um, the same. Mm-hmm. Yeah, yeah. I, I only ask because I see a lot of uh, uh, pho- photography from from Europe, and and their fallow just seems to be uh, a lot healthier than ours in, com- uh, in comparison. But there's a lot yeah. of a lot bigger trophies as well. So yeah. Yeah, mate, it's a, there's a very strong hunting culture uh, throughout, like sort of the Scandinavian areas. Um, and once again, it's, uh, you know, it's viewed as quite normal, especially in those more rural areas where they can go out and, and do the hunting and stuff. Um, yeah, you know, I mean, if you look at uh, like uh, Seiko and Tika, you know, a lot of their advertising or what are they doing you know you've got a hunter you know walking through all this harsh winter and the the landscape and everything and it's yeah it's really like that like uh in uh finland the coldest that i've been in is minus 42 and um you know that's degrees celsius and it's just insane like uh you know when you're in in that sort of cold um like yeah, I I have no interest in hunting in that cold. It's not fun. <laughs> <laughs> I prefer to be inside, sitting around the fireplace, enjoying you know enjoying a drink with some friends or something. Like I just I don't see the fun in being out in minus forty two. I've I've been there, done it, and yeah, never again. <laughs> <laughs> Sounds fair enough, I reckon. <laughs> All right, Ozzy, we'll go on to the next one. What's your favourite food? Thai food. Hey. Oh. Is that from having been over there and tried the Uji uh, stuff or yeah. just yep. like it? Yep. So um, one of the guys I went to school with, uh, I don't know if anybody's into kickboxing, but uh, you know, he calls himself uh, John Wayne Parr. I don't know if you've heard of him, the Australian kickboxer. Um, oh, yeah. 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 So yeah, Wayne is his first name, the real name, Wayne Parr. He and I um, went to school together. Um, and we used to train at a my cousin ran a uh, a dojo and we used to train there for a while so uh, it was funny actually when um, i caught up with him like just uh, just online we were sort of texting away and and uh, he said oh you know come down to the gold coast and let's have a spa you know and i'm thinking it's been a few years and i know you're a half my height back then but you you're probably twice as tough as me now and you'll probably kick the living crap out of me so i'll decline the offer you know so but yeah he he's a real nice guy and some of the videos i've seen of him now you know is exactly how i remember him when we were teenagers like just a yeah, really level-headed sort of guy so um you know he went over there at that time doing a lot of fighting and training but mine was more backpacking you know when i was a teenager um, that was my experience over there and travelling up through Asia and, um, yeah, all the way up to Hong Kong and China at the time. So, yeah. It's funny how the, uh, especially Asian cuisines, once it once you, having it over there versus having it in Australia is very different. Like they st- kind of water it down a bit over here and change it. Oh, yeah. The West well, see, see I, I like chilli. So, you know, in, in Thailand, if you say you want Thai hot, like that, that, that dish is coming out like lava, you know, um, <laughs> where... You know, we're here in Australia, you go into a Thai restaurant and say, oh, you know, I want Thai hot and it'll come out with some bird's eyes on it and that'll be about it. So, 
um, yeah, <laughs> it's, 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 it's completely different in that, in that sense. But, uh, yeah, I just enjoy the food, you know, I enjoy those sort of stir fries and stuff. And I guess that's sort of carried over a bit where I've done a few cooking uh, videos myself on the channel, only a handful. And, you know, like with rabbit, like I'll make like a hock in uh, rabbit stir fry, you know, so that's something a little bit sort of similar, I guess. Um, so those sort of things I just enjoy eating. Perfect. I like it. Nice. All right. Next one. What was your first job, Ozzy? Uh, veterinary assistant. <laughs> there you go. <laughs> you, a turn. Okay. What, what age are we talking? How'd you land that one? Uh, so basically, I was about 15 at the time. Um, and I was, before I was old enough to work, I was working at the vet surgery um, to actually help out and because I wanted to become a vet. And um, so that was what I first was studying to do um many years ago now but um yeah that was the first job like the first sort of paid job i had um prior to that i mean i worked a lot uh, in my neighborhood so I'd, I'd do things like i'd mow lawns and you know tree lopping doing all that sort of thing you know for for different neighbors and things like that and we had um uh, it's about five thousand acres um property and um my cousin runs that to this day so i used to go and i used to do a fair bit of farm work and things so it was a bit of an influence that way as well but the first sort of ridgy didge paid job was uh yeah veterinary assistant there you go it's it's quite interesting that well it's not interesting because we're, we're all hunters but we all love animals and yeah obviously you have a love for animals plus you hunt yeah. so. Yeah, that, mate. Yeah. That one speaks volumes in itself, and that you know most hunters actually really love animals. Yeah, yeah. care about them. Yeah, probably. Yeah, more. that's right. That's right. Like, I mean, you know, like as I've said numerous times on the channel, like I don't care even if they're a feral pest. Like they don't deserve to be tortured. You know, they're just doing what they do naturally. Um, you know, you're going to take the shot, make sure it's ethical. It's pretty simple. It is. Yeah. Are you uh, running cattle full time now? Yeah, mate. Yeah, I've got, uh, well, I've just sold a fair few. Uh, at the moment, I've got 21 head still here, but um, yeah, I'm going to have more on the ground soon. So, yeah, I, and I need to because uh, I've got basically, well, three three paddocks, as I call them. And, uh, you know, I need to get them on the other paddocks because uh, I'm sick of mowing. <laughs> <laughs> you had a, a fair bit of rain in the last little while. Well, the last 12 months or so up there haven't you yeah it's insane mate we've we've had at the moment it's it's been raining today um just sort of light rain so it's not too bad but the problem is like obviously where i do my reviews you know it's in that gully and that's why when i've done the videos like even two weeks after it's rained i'm still walking through absolute slop you know um it's just crazy and um yeah, you know, people don't sort of understand. I had a had a mate of mine drop over here yesterday. He wanted to sign in a couple of rifles, and, and you know, before he went sort of way out west. And I said, yeah, by all means, come on out. And I said, look, it's probably still a bit wet, you know, um, down in that area. And uh, he's like, surely not, you know. And I said, well, you'll see. Sure enough, like, you know, it hadn't. Excuse me, it hadn't rained for I don't know about a couple of weeks anyway, and we've had some pretty warm, dry, sunny days and. Yep, got up towards the 100-yard uh, part there and it was just all slosh and, yeah, <laughs> a big, and a big red belly black snake sitting there watching us as well. So, yeah. Sorry, that cut me out then. Uh, yeah. Sorry, I said, and there's a big red belly black snake sitting there watching us as well. So, <laughs> oh, gee, not that. Yeah. <laughs> that's all right. They're not poisonous, are they? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah, that's right. I'll just give you a love tap. <laughs> <laughs> That, that sparks a question for me then. Uh, so when you're doing your reviews, is it a matter of trying to do quite a few to sort of make use of the time that you have available or you still have to space yeah. them out just so you're not... Uh, a bit of both, mate. It depends what I'm doing. Like if I'm doing a long-distance review, that's an all-day thing, um, you know, because by the time you you do the desktop part, you, you end up zeroing it there at 100 and then you start going out to see where it is on target at, you know, 600, 800, 1,000. Like, it's an all-day thing um, because then, you know, between doing the, the shots on the gong, you know, then you've got to drive down to the gong, spray it, get back, you know, set all the cameras up, um, stuff like that. And, I mean, I, I, and 
and there's also really strange interruptions that have that have happened. Um, I don't think I've, I've told this story for for quite some time, but um, I had a when I was doing the Seiko 85 long range review in 300 wind mags, like. Yeah, you know, I'd set up and I was really in a hurry to get everything done before I lose the light of the day. And next minute, I'm not kidding you, like I look up in the air and here's this guy like coming down on a parachute. <laughs> and, uh, and I'm just saying, what the hell is going on here? Um, and, uh, you know, but he he said he needed to land somewhere. And I'm just like, and, and I'm like, they could like obviously hear me shooting. So it wasn't one, there was 30 of them. And um, and they've all landed between where I was shooting, between me and the target. And so obviously I, I'd stopped shooting. And um, one of the guys says, um, oh, you should have taken a shot at us, mate, you know, like this. And I just looked him in the eye like dead serious. I said, no, we're, we're responsible here with firearms. I don't know what clowns you think you, um, you know, you're seeing with a firearm, but that's not us here. So, um, you know, and uh, I'm very particular about that sort of thing. Uh, even though he was just having a bit of a joke, but it's not a funny joke. Like it's yeah. just how people like to taint all of us as just you know mad gun nuts who'll just shoot up everything and anything we can get a hold of. Mm-hmm. Um, yeah. So anyhow, I had to had to march them off the property, and uh, they needed somewhere to land from one of the local clubs, and I couldn't believe it at the time because one guy, like when he lands, he just hops up and just starts peeing, like you know, <laughs> like like he owns the joint, and I'm just like. <laughs> I'm, I'm looking around for like candid camera or something going is this, is this, this can't be real you know but, and, um, meanwhile you're looking him down a scope <laughs> yeah. <laughs> I, i'm just yeah i couldn't believe it so you know there are some sort of funny things when i look back at it now like that that you know hold up reviews but yeah to answer your question mate like i'll try to get a couple done if i can but if I can't, depending on the review, it'll get done over the space of a few days. So I might do one today, get everything done and edited and sorted out to where I'm happy with it. And then I'll go, right, okay, I'll get on to the next one. Because the, the, the big problem with it is it's like a data dump in your head. So I've got all the facts and, and the figures and specs running through my head. Um, and then, you know, so if you suddenly you're onto the next product, well, all of a sudden you've got to consume like a sponge all the the data and specs on that as well. So you're, you're constantly like inputting data and dumping and onto the next. So I find if I try to do like sort of four in a day or something like it's just like, it's like a memory overload type thing. Um, and then I find that I'll probably miss some things that I want to talk about. So that's why I like to just space it out. But if I've got a couple of good days of sunshine, then I'll space it out over those couple of days. Makes good sense to me. Yeah, it does. That's a fair amount of effort <laughs> just for some reviews. <laughs> oh, I mean, some of the some of the basic reviews we've done are just a few minutes long. The amount of takes and editing and stuff you got. Yeah, mate. Oh, it's so time consuming. People don't realise that's the thing. So when you got someone ripping on you on YouTube, you're just like, come on, man. Like, we've put the time in to do this. Yeah. And what are you doing? <laughs> you yeah, know. that's right. Yeah, mate. It basically... Every free weekend and and free time that I've had over the last, you know, uh, what, uh, 10 years pretty much, um, I've dedicated um, to to YouTube. Like, I haven't had a holiday in nine years. So, that nine years is the last time I, I went away somewhere for a holiday. Far out. Time for a break. <laughs> yeah, it is. It is time for a break, but... That's the problem. I'm I'm a sucker for punishment, you know. Like I enjoy doing it and that, but you enjoy doing it, but it's workload. So. Yeah. What's uh, a yeah. one video that or a review that you sort of sticks in your mind of what you've enjoyed the most? Mm, probably, uh, I don't know. I like the semi-auto reviews naturally when I, you know, I, I show them uh, because it's just something a little bit different. It reminds me of pre '96. Um, uh, you know, there are a handful of reviews of uh, certain products that I've really, really enjoyed. That ticker A one tack is one of them, hands down. Um, you know, I was just on such a high after I I, I filmed that um, because it just shot so well. It was just so nice to use. Um, you know, and then you see, 
you know, you'll see uneducated people having a go at ticker. Like, and you're just going, really? Well, if you've actually used one, I mean, like, how many ticker reviews have I done now? You know, and every one of them, like, shoots half an inch and a hundred with factory ammo. What more do you want? Yeah. Uh, exactly. You know, so so that sort of thing I like. You know, I love my shoots rifles in the rimfire, you know, range especially. Um, you know, I've got a soft spot for them. Um, but practical, um, you know, I like things like the Ruger American and that when I'm out on the farm because, you know, they take the knocks and all that sort of thing. So, mate, it'd be, to answer your question, it, it would be probably hard to narrow down maybe one or two reviews that that are really special. But, um, yeah, I think probably the ones that would stand out are the semi-autos because it just takes so much time to get them as well. Yeah. It's not like just putting in for a PTA and going to your gun shop and picking it up. You've got to do... Um, well, depending on how I apply, whether it's as a primary producer on the B709 or as federal pest control on attorney general's import permits, you know, in the past I've I've had both, and you know, it's it depends on the delays of each one to how much longer that gets added on to importing that firearm, waiting for all the red tape and the paperwork to clear. So by the time you know when I finally get it in my hands, it's that extra bit special, if that makes sense. Yep. Yep. Yeah. Mm. Is there a limit to how many uh, semis you're allowed now? Uh, so under the legislation up here for Cat D, for feral pest control, it's two. Mm-hmm. Um, so, you know, so for me, it's the Ruger SR556 and the Ruger SR762, um, yeah, both which I end up reviewing. Uh, for Cat Cs for feral pest control, there's nothing in the legislation up here. However, the legislation says you can have one rifle, Cat C rifle, one Cat C shotgun, or you can have more um, if you apply and an authorised officer deems it necessary, taking into consideration the area size. So, for example, I had um, so I had four Cat Cs for feral pest control, um, and that was because one of the properties I was contracted to was 120,000 acres. Um, so, you know, you're, you're on 120,000 acres, it, it's reasonable to have a backup. Um, you know, you do a firing pin, something goes wrong or, or whatever happens. Well, you can't have a mobile armory with you that can just, you know, fix it and sort it. And you're being paid by that farmer or the landowner to, to eradicate feral pests. They're not paying you to be, spend two or three hours trying to fix something. Mm. So, um, you know, it's reasonable to have those backups for it. But when you're on, like, say, for example, here, like I'm on 300 acres. So, you know, I have one Cat C rifle, one Cat C shotgun. Yeah, yeah. Do you, with the... Um with your your uh, contracting does this the rifle that you use for that property is that like a a registered type thing so okay that rifle is registered to that property your use on that property only kind of so what they do and it's and it is written into the legislation up here for cat d it has to be the shire okay so the council shire so that what so in other words what you typically do as a as a contract shooter up here is you try to get as many contracts as you can from different shires. So hypothetically, if uh, I get a contract in, um, I don't know, let's, let's say like Southern Downs Shire up towards Toowoomba there. Um, if I get a call out to go to any other property and do pest control, well, I don't have to then put in that contract to be authorised to go there because I'm already authorised in that shire. So that's that's how it works. But with um, excuse me, with uh, Cat C, there's no requirement for that. So what I used to do was, if I'd get called out to a property, well, I'd go there with Cat C firearms, assess it, and have a look at it, um, and then if it was something that was going to be ongoing, well, then I would get a contract signed up, um, you know, listing their property, what what's there, etc., uh, etc. Cetera, et cetera. And then you put it into weapons licensing, which is our firearms registry up here. And then, yeah, how long is a piece of string? You might get approved in a month. It might be three months. Um, sometimes it's been six. It's been very frustrating. And meanwhile, you've got a customer who's saying, well, where the hell are you? And you've got to try to explain to them, well, look, because of red tape, um, I can't actually come out to, to, uh, to do that right now. Um, so, you know, it can be frustrating. And at the end of the day, 
uh, people think that it's sort of all fun and games. Well, it's not because these farmers or landholders aren't paying you to come out with a bolt action and get a trophy buck or something like that. I mean, I've been on contracts before with deer and they want every deer dropped. They don't want you harvesting the meat. They don't care. They're like, oh, you harvest that in your own time. We're not paying you for it. Um, so you're going along, bang, 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 just dropping them, and that's where they stay, um, which I see as disappointing because there's a lot of quality meat that goes to waste. But you're there to do a job. It's not recreational. Yeah. Makes sense. Is it possible to make a living doing contract shooting these days in Australia? Yeah, I think it is. You've got to have the right contract um, mm -hmm. to do it. Um, but there's definitely... There is definitely money there, and it's a lot of people just don't know. Um, so, for example, I was at a, uh, a local <laughs> nursery there, and um, anyhow, the woman had brought up that uh, she had a problem with uh, a fox uh, or foxes coming past, and they were attacking and killing some of the lambs that she had out the back and uh, all that. And I said, oh, you know, I do feral pest control. And she's like, oh, can you please come out? You know, um, how much do you charge? Blah, blah, blah. And, and um, it's surprising the amount of people that just don't know that those services are available. And once again, I put that back to the fact that, yeah, you know, we're all almost like emotionally bullied into not advertising it um, mm. because it's the whole firearms thing when it should be, in my view, just like any other business. Um, you know, um, why, when you're conducting a complete legal business, should you feel bullied or hampered or... Um, you know, pushed into a corner, unable to promote or advertise your business. It shouldn't be like that. Mm. So it's hard in SA. I don't. I can't speak for the other states, but we have this law where if we cause someone fear, uh, so say if we've got our own property, you're shooting on it. Okay, it's a nicety to go tell your neighbours and say, look, I'm going to shoot tomorrow. You know, cool. If you've got a big enough property, well, you don't really need to do it. But if someone's on your property and they see you with a firearm and it causes them fear, they can ring the police and straight away you're you're just you're in the wrong as a shooter. Just immediately here in South Australia, um, they'll they'll come take the firearms until they've done an investigation and 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 things like that. Um, I don't know if that's that's up there, but it's understandable not to uh, promote or advertise or anything like that because it's so hard just to be in trouble for doing the right thing or doing yeah. what you're allowed to do. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> And it, it's designed that way in my view. I mean, like, look, for example, up here, um, you know, the firearms legislation is very specific where, um, you know, only a licence holder can be charged with uh, insecure storage of firearm. A criminal can't because they're not licensed. It's only a licence holder that can be. So, um, you know, so when you see stuff like that, um, my view on it is that would lead any reasonable person to look at it and just go, is this about getting the criminals or is it about getting the licensed people? Yeah. Um, and that's where I think there's a lot of people that have a, a, a big issue with it. Um, and I, I know when I, I met with, uh, a couple of years ago, I met with a, a federal member in, in regards to this because all of it had stemmed, you know, federally and was pushed down to the states. And, you know, and that's what I said. I said, like, you know, I think that I, I could speak on behalf of most shooters. All we want is fair, reasonable gun laws. Like, we don't want to see firearms, you know, getting in the hands of people who shouldn't have them, be it mentally ill people or, or children. Um, you know, um, or, or criminals. Like, none of us want that. Um, so why not work together? Why not be on the same page? But it's very clear when you start dealing um, with the different firearm registries that they are not on your side um, at all. And you are the enemy and you're treated that way when you uh, contact them. And that's what I've got a real issue with um, because my view on it, once again, is for all those years of law-abiding um, you know, service to the community, I guess, um, of being a licensed shooter. Like you're not out there committing crimes or, you know, you're not out there committing DVs or anything like that because you wouldn't have firearms. Um, wouldn't you as a, as a, as a, you know, a government official um, who's in charge of setting these, these rules and regulations in place, look at this group of people who on a whole um, are the most law-abiding group of people you've got in your community and actually 
pat him on the head and say, look, thanks so much for, you know, your years of being law-abiding uh, and say, okay, well, it's reasonable for, you know, you, you know, to have firearms of your choice and not be so um, contradictory, I think, is a better term for it with what we can and can't have. Like, you know, I'll give you an example that really sort of annoys me is, um, you know, like... Uh, here in Queensland, like we can't have anything chambered in 50 BMG. It's, it's category R, which is where full auto machine guns are, grenades, all that sort of stuff. Um, so it's like the highest regulated category that usually is only open, obviously, to the government or a licensed armourer up here can be ca um, licensed for category R. So, yeah, you can't have anything chambered in 50 BMG, even if it is just a single shot or even just normal bolt action, whatever. But I go over the border into New South Wales and no problem there. But if you take your ticker A1 TAC into New South Wales with a folding <laughs> stock on it, um, you know, you, you might as well kiss your backside goodbye because you're going to get, you know, you're going to get thrown to the walls. Um, <laughs> so, Insane. you know, and so when you, when you see things like that and, you know, anyone watching this could say, oh, you know, I, I'm having a go at the system or whatever. Well, no, I'm not. What I'm doing is just pointing out their rules of what they're saying we can and can't do. And I put it out to anybody else who is watching this. Well, do you think that's fair and reasonable? Um, they're supposed to be uniform gun laws. Um, but the facts are they're far from it. Mm. Yeah. I would like to know how they watered down from federally to state who who actually uh, changes that because i've heard of of police commissioners enforcing a a, a new law like appearance laws or, th or things like that or yeah. or obviously your local you know political party might in their campaign or whatever uh, but i'd like to know who actually does that without letting the shooting community have their voice because it seems to happen just instantly suddenly it's it's a new new bit of legislation or law that's on the firearms website and you yeah. you don't know anything about it until you read it yeah yeah 100 percent uh and when what you look at it on the flip side of that um if there is something about uh you know easing a regulation whether that just be something administrative you know, like um, no waiting period on a subsequent PTA or something like that. All of a sudden, everyone yeah. gets a say from the antis to yeah. um, <laughs> people like victims of gun violence and all this sort of stuff. But if it's anything to do with restricting a law, um, I mean, the, the, these are the facts. They have well and truly gone out of their way to keep major stakeholders from the shooting industry away from any decision making process. Um, and and why personally I think that is um, is I believe it's because of their lack of knowledge. Um, it's like anything, you know. Like if you have a a car enthusiast, for example, um, you know they're going to walk rings around uh, politicians who are trying to bring in new laws and that because they're just going to go, well, what about X, Y, Z? And the politician's going to be, oh, hang on, hang on, I've got to speak to my aide. You know, they've got no idea. Yeah. It's exactly the same in the firearms world. Like the, the politicians that I've met with, so few of them have any idea whatsoever. And when you point it out in very simplistic terms, the contradictions and everything, they go, oh, well, it's just a system we got. It's, it's, it's working. That's what they say. So they just write it off. It's um, <laughs> yeah, it's working for them. <laughs> yeah. 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 <laughs> it's frustrating. It's frustrating. Yeah, it, doesn't, it doesn't work really well for us when you've got those contradictions, like, for example, of what I just pointed out. It's just, yeah, it just leaves you shaking your head, just going, well, hang on, I thought the underlying reason for all this was public safety. Um, I, I mean, personally, if I was a, uh, you know, a resident in New South Wales, I would probably feel a lot more comfortable with someone having a folding stock than a 50 BMG, you know, if they were to go bad, potentially. Like, you know, let's be honest. I guess that's one thing we're sort of, sort of dealing with here in SA at the moment with the proposal of banning bow, hunting bows. Yeah. Hunting with a bow. Um, yeah. But yet they say banning hunting with a bow but maintaining target shooting, but yet all their sort of evidence and there is a back up there sort of uh proposal 
is all illegal hunting with target tip arrows. Mm. So yeah. it's just, I don't know, not there. There's sort of no real sort of forethought with all that. Yeah, but that's how it goes these days, you see, is um, that's the nitty gritty. Though when you scratch the surface, that's what's really happening. But is that what is what gets promoted when they're trying to get this over the line? No, it's not. It would simply be a horror story about um, animals, wildlife being shot by reckless people with bows. Uh, this is what I'm imagining. Um, and they will get the emotional support from the public. Uh, and then that's how they'll ban it. But this is a concern that I've got is no one scratches the surface or very few of us scratch the surface and actually have a look at what's being proposed. When you, you know, excuse me, uh, when they have, for example, uh, like Canada, you know, with all the bans that they had over there and they said, we just want to get those assault rifles away. But then when you had a look at the list of what it included, it was every semi-automatic. Um, you know, so this is what I mean. They come out with an emotional catchphrase like we've got to get rid of assault rifles. Well, there wasn't one assault rifle on the on the list because everyone in the shooting world knows an assault rifle is a select fire full automatic. Yeah. Um, that had nothing to do with it. But once again, mislead the public to go, yeah. oh, assault rifles. How could anyone possibly disagree with taking away assault rifles? <laughs> it was the same thing pushed here in 96. But what did, what what was the reality of what happened? We lost our Ruger 1022s, probably the, the most loved and most popular semi-automatic rifle that uh, the majority of us all had. Um, and I know myself from going to ranges when I was, you know, when I was just a kid pre-96. Um, like, mate, you didn't see many AR-15s or anything like that. The, predominantly what you saw was SKSs, SKKs, um, and like 1022s, and then you'd see some semi-auto shotguns. Like... That was predominantly what you would see. Um, so the whole thing of, oh, we've got to get rid of all these, uh, you know, assault rifles and everything like that. But no, that's that's not right because the majority of stuff handed in um, was certainly not an assault rifle. Um, you know, and, and that's, once again, the, the, another thing that I have a, a, a very big issue with is just be honest. Like, you know, if you want to get rid of semi-auto, this is what I say to politicians, like, be honest, just say it. Don't try to uh, manipulate or mislead people with some emotional catchphrase that has nothing to do with what you're actually trying to do. Yep. Oh, you, you hit the nail on the head. <clears throat> Excuse me. I mean, what's frustrating about this proposed bow hunting ban is uh, the MP who's brought it to light and is, is advocating for it. She's the first one of the first things she said is it is bow hunting is illegal in every state except mm. South Australia and Victoria, yeah. <laughs> which is completely false. false. Yeah. It's only Tasmania. So I mean, yeah, it is eternally frustrating, man. So I think that's why yeah. we just make sure we're well educated on things and make sure we can counter argue um, eloquently, but also with um, a bit of facts behind us as well to to counter mm. these ridiculous proposals that come into to place. But um yeah, it's it's a stressful time, but um, we got to do it. Unfortunately, yep. Speaking of stress, <laughs> speaking of stress, Aussie, you haven't had a break in nearly a decade, mate. <laughs> so <laughs> yeah. this sort of leads to my next question: If you could trade places with anyone in the world, who would that be? Be the prime minister, and I'd start changing gun laws. <laughs> <laughs> Done. <laughs> you got my <one>, way. <laughs> <laughs> Love it. See, this... and, it, and it would simply be based on uh, factual evidence, uh, 100%. Um, that's what it would be, be on common sense and, and evidence-based uh, uh, findings. And that's the thing. Like, I might be very pro-gun, as most people know. However, if someone comes to me and they show me a legitimate argument, by, uh, you know, backed with facts, um, you know, I'll accept that, even if it does mean, look, that means it's... Uh, viewed as anti-gun well that's fine as long as you've got the evidence to prove it and that's been my argument the whole time is when i do go and speak to politicians well let's have a debate but let's be factual um you know so there's there's give and take on both sides um and i think that yeah there's there needs to be a, a lot more improvement um in my view with all that i mean this is about firearms this is every law you know like it's, there just needs to be the facts and, and the way that it, it will be interpreted and used on the actual ground, not just in an office somewhere where they go, oh, this looks really good and this is you know what I've referred to over the years as feel-good legislation. 
it makes everyone feel good, but when you actually scratch the surface and look at it in reality, it's far, far from that in my view. Mm. Yeah. I like that answer because we pose this question to everyone and a lot of people go, oh, no, I love my life. I'd never trade places. or oh, well, So I said, oh, well, give us an answer. Well, if you could just experience someone's <laughs> life in a week where you could change something or whatever, oh, you know, there'll be a billionaire. We could, oh, I'll spend that money or buy a heap of stuff or whatever. But I think you're the first person yeah. to actually say, I'm going to be the PM. I'm going to change, change some stuff. <laughs> change <this. laughs> so now, nah, kudos to you, man. I think that would be a good idea. Yeah. <laughs> Or run them all, vote for you. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah. They say that politics is pretty dirty and you've got to be dishonest to, <laughs> to be successful, so I don't know how well I'd go. Yeah. Or it could be a refreshing change to have an honest person in politics. <laughs> yeah, or, or, someone, or someone who just lives up to what they promise on their election promises <laughs> yeah. would be would be a great start. I'd like to see that. Hello, there's a novel idea. <laughs> yeah, that's right. Actually, actually be accountable for the promises that you make that get you elected. So. But in the fine print it says maybe. <laughs> so yeah. <laughs> yeah, that's it. Hey Yozzy, what's the most dangerous thing you've ever done? Um on a more humorous side, I've dated a couple of bad women in my life. Um, <laughs> I think you've all been <laughs> Yeah, yeah. I think <laughs> that, that, that could be pretty dangerous if you haven't got your, you know, your ducks lined up in a row. That could be real dangerous for you. But, uh, but yeah, mate, all jokes aside, I think um, probably, I would say probably when I was younger, like, uh, you know, like, like backpacking around and stuff like that, probably, um, probably being a bit naive and going into a few sort of you know dodgy areas and things that uh you know i wasn't too sure like i mem i remember i was in uh florida uh in in miami at the time and when i flew in i uh i ended up just hiring a this chevy and thought oh well, you know just do what most people do just get in and just start driving you know and um anyhow i kept driving and i i thought oh, i'd better pull into a like a servo or gas station as they call it um and just ask for some directions and then anyway, i pulled in and like the guy behind the glass couldn't even speak english like he was you know obviously latina like um so spanish or, or some other you know perhaps portuguese language he spoke i don't know but he was like no he didn't understand and um anyhow there was some uh there was some <laughs> gang bangers out in the the car park and uh i remember coming out and um yeah, they'd come up to me and they'd surround me like, you got money, you know, like this sort of thing. And then I was just, hey, hey, you know, I'm just a traveler. I got nothing on me and stuff like that. And they, they end up cutting me a bit of a break. And um, yeah, like just that sort of thing, you know. So I probably couldn't pinpoint it to one one thing being dangerous. But, you know, that kind of thing when I was younger, traveling around the world a lot um, and not really having a good understanding in that situational awareness of where you should and shouldn't go. Um, yeah, probably. Uh, yeah, if I could uh, do things again, I'd probably do it a little bit differently in that regard. <laughs> <laughs> Did they recognise that you're Australian, or they just didn't care? Uh, mate, they they sort of yeah, they were a little bit better then. I just said, oh, you know, I'm Australian. I'll just yeah, come over for a bit of a look around, and you know, and Australians are fairly popular uh, in the states in general. I find so, you know, it's it's okay. And then they have sort of changed their attitude. I mean, look, I remember. Um, geez, it just come to my mind now. Like when I was in uh, in Stockholm, the capital of Sweden, there, I remember years ago, a uh, girl I was with was uh, she was coloured, so she wasn't classed as black, she wasn't classed as white, she was coloured, so she was South African. And uh, anyhow, like I remember, we went into McDonald's um, in uh, in Stockholm, and um, anyhow, I turned around, and some neo Nazis had uh, surrounded her and were pushing her around, and all that sort of thing and anyhow so i'd i'd run up and sort of intervened and you know pulled the whole oh you know we're, we're just australian and everything and they just they started to change their their tune because there was there was a big problem over there um mm. you know um there, there there is a lot of problems in europe with like um you know obviously far left and far right um groups and as i say to a lot of people i, I don't really care if people are uh are left or they're right in their views or whatever but it's whenever you get to uh, the extreme on either sides that's when people use violence to to promote their beliefs which i'm strictly against um because it's not going to 
get the message through. Um, you know, so um, yeah, so I got to see that sort of thing too, and yeah, that was that was pretty dangerous. I was pretty worried then. I thought, you know, I thought we we're going to end up in an ambulance here, <laughs> probably in hospital. But uh, thankfully, we were able to get our you know talk our way out of it and play sort of the innocent uh, tourist, so to speak. Uh, <laughs> Far out. How many times you use that excuse for? Oh <laughs> <laughs> uh, yeah, a handful. <laughs> <laughs> work out it works. Uh, yeah, yeah. What, what's not broken? <laughs> yeah, that's right. Yeah. So. All right. Well, next question, Aussie. What's the best piece of advice you've ever been given? Um, stop. Uh, basically, wasting your money on going out and put it into bricks and mortar. So yeah, yeah that was there was a. There was a uh, an old friend of mine had said that to me. Uh, my old man very much was the the same when I was younger, saying that. So I sort of heard it from a couple of people that were close to me, and yeah, it was the best thing I ever did. Um, you know, I was uh, what was I twenty uh, twenty two when I owned my first home. Bloody hell! Yeah, <laughs> makes a lot of sense. I mean, yeah, a lot of people that age are still, like you said, like going out partying and mm, spending yeah. their money and. Not realizing they're going to invest in their future, so they were bricks and mortar. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. <laughs> yeah on, on alcohol. Yeah, it's a lot. Yeah, yeah. Uh, we've 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 all been there, and um, you know, and that's the thing. Like you, like by all means, like yeah, it's great socializing and going out and things like that. But you've got to square away your private life. Uh, that's my view on it. Um, so yeah, you know, even when I was young, a lot of a lot of friends and everything were just you know, wasting their money, had no savings, were just paying rent, and I thought, yeah, no, why would I pay rent when I can, you know, I can get into my own home and, uh, you know, do it that way, and I did. So um, you know, I, yeah, had my own home at 22, uh, built my second home by the time I was 25, 26. Um, so yeah, I was pretty motivated. Well, I still am, I guess. But um, yeah, I was, I was pretty motivated when I was younger to uh, achieve and get things done. Yep. Yeah, bloody hell! I kind of almost feel sorry for our for the next generation coming through because the prices of houses. Oh, they're, they're, they're fucked at the moment. Uh, yeah, they are. Yeah, yeah, mate. They are. I, I caught up with a nephew of mine. He's only twenty two, and um, yeah, he and his partner are living in this. Uh, like honestly, it looks like a one-bedroom hotel room. That's that's honestly what it looks like. Um, you know, neat and tidy, modern, all that sort of thing. But uh, you know, uh, he's paying. I think he said six fifty, six fifty or six hundred a week for it. A week, um, you know. And I'm just like, like you know, this is just such dead money. It's a nice place to live and everything like that. But you know, even if you're splitting it with your partner before you do anything. You've got you've got to say, oh, well, there's three hundred bucks out of my wage, your wage for the week before we even look at any other expense. You know, um, and I see it as a a big problem, like you say. Like I I do worry about that next generation because you know you see them now they don't have a hope in hell because what they're going to do is they're going to be a slave to the mortgage because um, they'll never pay it off. Like if you're getting a mortgage of say seven hundred thousand dollars, like seriously, how are you ever going to pay that off? Um, yeah, yeah. <laughs> and that's uh before the economy crashes, uh, interest rate goes through the roof. <laughs> yeah, exactly. I mean, this this happened. I mean, this crash that I believe is very imminent. Um, and why I believe it is because you know in '07, um, it it happened virtually exactly the same. Every month we had you know interest rates going up. Um, at the time, I mean, I was, geez, I was spewing because. Uh, I had a uh, a property that I had sold. Well, it was under contract. Then the crash happened. Uh, then they could get finance. So then it just sat there, and then no one had any work or anything like that. It was it was terrible. So, um, you know, I know only too well what it's like to to go through that, and I can see that happening now. And I mean, I, I don't know about what it's like on the news down there, but on the news up here, they're finally starting to talk about it and say. Well, yeah, you know, um, there's a crash coming. You know, uh, buyers are getting cold feet because a lot of them are being priced out of the market now with all the interest rate increases. So, you know, it's going to have a very much a big flow on effect, um, and and that's where I think bringing it back to the shooting uh, world, 
um, I think honestly that's where a lot of people are going to want to be back to basics. So if you're a hunter, for example, you're going to go out and you're going to get yourself some venison. Um, you know, so even if you're living off that for a couple of months, whatever, like that, to to actually put more money on the table for other things in hard times. And I think that's something that has really escaped a lot of people here in Australia since the times of our parents and grandparents. You know, um, in those uh, Great Depression years and even the the subsequent years after that, like post-war and everything, when times were still pretty tough. Um, I don't think a lot of people of this generation now, I mean, they've certainly not even experienced what it's like to go without because they have this real big sense of entitlement. Uh, they're entitled to their iPhone. They're entitled to take away. They're entitled to watching TV. All those sort of things were a privilege when I was a kid. Um, you know, apart from the iPhone, that wasn't around naturally. But, um, you know, it's just that sort of mentality I, I, I very strongly disagree with. And I think that it's going to bite a lot of the younger generation in the backside because once that's taken away from them it doesn't matter how much they want to put a tantrum on no one's going to give you that stuff so um you know especially like you have a look over and like obviously with what's happening in europe with ukraine russia um i'm sure there's a lot of people there that are going without um and that's where my thought on it is people need to have some skills so skills to be able to go out hunt butcher your own food, um, you know, have, be sensible, have some stocks put away. Like, I mean, you know, most of the farming um, areas here, all the property owners, you know, they'll have like a month or two months worth of food supply, you know, whether it be meat in the freezer, like the deep freeze, and they'll have some, you know, canned veggies and all that sort of thing. And I'm not suggesting someone needs to be a two-year uh, worth, um, you know, or have two years worth of supply like some sort of crazy doomsday prepper, but be realistic and there's nothing crazy about having one or two months supply of things so that, you know, if times do hit and they're pretty hard, um, well, you're not going to go without. Mm. That's interesting you bring that up actually because one of our listeners was having a bit of a chat to us today and he was sort of suggesting, well, just keep an eye on these things because we were, specifically we we're talking about the proposed bow hunting ban, but on the on the wider side of things it was actually more what he was suggesting is without being you know tinfoil hat and conspiracy theory about it is that yeah. governments actually don't want people to possess the skills mm. to be able to get their own food they want us to be reliant mm. on them mm. and that's, right. that's, that's actually a fair point mate. <laughs> well, i agree with him <laughs> because it validates yeah. their existence man if we rely on them you know, if, if we don't well what use are they so, yeah. well, they they love, uh, as I, I say it, the the government loves you being on their bosom. So um, you know whether that's whether that's through welfare or uh, or whatever it is. Because I mean, let's be honest. I mean, this is well documented that uh, you know various, uh, especially socialist governments, rely on the welfare voting population to get power. Mm -hmm. um, you know, I mean, it, it certainly happens here. I mean, you go to a lot of low socioeconomic areas here in Queensland; they're labour through and through. Like you will not get them to change, and why? Because uh, they're the ones who give them the free handouts, and yeah. and uh, it makes their particular situation and lifestyle easy. That's why they're in power. Um, yet if someone wants to get in there and you know, make people work and all that sort of stuff, well, they'll be basically run out of that electorate. Um, they won't get anywhere. So yeah, you know, it, I mean, they're the facts. No, that's true. It's true. It's interesting discussion point to be honest about. <laughs> it's unfortunate we're on this revolving labor liberal labor liberal, and it, it's, it, people get fed up with one, and we change the next. And yeah, oh, everyone has a four year memory, but no one remembers the last government in and how not good or bad they years. were or whatever. Yeah, not even you know. That. No, I, I remember one night I was just uh, I, I actually I pulled into a um, just a uh, like a, a noodle takeaway place and. Uh, it was funny at the time there was an election on and uh, the owner had come out and uh, he was talking to me and um, I, I think he was Chinese, his, his background, um, um, his accent was very much sort of Chinese English and, um, you know, and he'd been here for just a couple of years and even he was saying to me, because uh, we got talking about the election, I said, oh, you know, um, yeah, it's going to be soon and he goes, um, uh, he goes, oh, who do you vote for? You know, like he had that real strong accent. And um, I said, oh, I'll probably at that time, I said, no, oh, I don't think it'll be Labor. I said, I, I won't be going that way. Um, and, and he was like, oh, Labor, no good. 
this is what he said, you know, he goes, no good, spend, spend, spend everything, spend. And then LMP comes, save, save. And then labor comes, spend, spend. <laughs> you know, like, and, and mate, and he, you know, this guy here, he was a, a working immigrant that had only been here a couple of years and he's telling me that. Yeah. Apologize to any uh, people of Chinese background who are watching this. I do a terrible accent, obviously, but. Uh, yeah. <laughs> right. <laughs> <laughs> but, uh, but that is exactly how he said it to me. And I was just like, yeah, mate, I, I, I agree with you, definitely. Mm. 100%. All right. Ozzy. What is your most treasured possession? Does it have to be a something that's like, um, you know, can it be something that's alive? Sure. If you possess My it. My dog. <laughs> <laughs> <You're sappy. laughs> Yeah, my dog. I, I'd say because uh, he's walking around here, he's wandering around because as soon as it becomes nightfall here, He's like under my feet because he wants to go out and get rabbits. And like he just loves them, you know. So, uh, and we're out at the moment. I, I cooked the last one up for him yesterday. But um, yeah, so he's sort of around my feet. But mate, he's he's everything to me. Um, you know, like uh, same as my last American staffy I had. You know, he was he was everything to me as well. Uh, this one, Hank, he's no different. He's a great dog, very well balanced dog, and. Um, you know, and he very much breaks down the stigma of the whole pit bull, you know. Um, people are just like, oh, he's so loving and friendly and that. And it's like, yeah, that's because I don't kick the crap out of him and torture him and try to, you know, make him fight other dogs and things like that. Like, um, I mean, it's just such common sense. But anyway, that's sort of going off on another tangent. But, uh, but yeah, but if uh, if it wasn't a living thing, if it was something, you know, non-living possession, I'd probably say my Benelli M4. Um, you can't treasure that too. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. yeah, it's uh, it's just something about that, you know. It's um, yeah, it, it's just an awesome shotgun. It's unlike any shotgun I've ever used. Like the, I mean, you know, I fire solids through that thing accurately out there at a hundred with it, and um, you know, just with a red dot on it, and the recoil feels like it's a two four three. Like it's just. It's unreal. The the technology and everything that Benelli put into that in '99 when they went for the Marine Corps contract, and that's why they made the the shotgun. Uh, it's just fantastic, um, you know. Um, and even when I did the recent um, Sulin Arms review, you know, which is a M4 yeah. straight core copy. I was going to ask you about yes, that. Yes, yes, it's very similar. I agree, it is very similar. But when you've got it up to the shoulder, and and you know. I'm not talking about psych, you know, shooting because obviously one's semi-auto, one's not. But just in general, it's kind of like, how can I put this? The Sulin to me is like, you know, having a maybe a Ford Falcon up to your shoulder. You know, um, yep, it does the job and, you know, everything is good on it. There's, there's no issues. But then you get the Benelli. And then you've got the Ferrari up to the shoulder. <laughs> and it's just these little things. You, you look at the finish, like, you know, just from where, um, you know, just from where the trigger guard meets the uh, uh, the pistol grip and stuff. Everything's just finer finished on the Benelli. There's, there's more tolerance, like tighter tolerance on it. Um, you can just see why you pay the money for it. Yep. Makes sense. Well, that, that answers another question I was going to ask later on. <laughs> yeah, Caleb's in the market for a shotgun, or was in the market for a shotgun. You give it up. <laughs> no, I've, I've switched focus to two D three at the moment. Yeah, fair enough. <laughs> Not too great with a shotgun, so <laughs> probably a very good choice. Yeah, I don't get out and practice as much as these boys. Out of the the straight pulls, which would be your your preferred system? uh what as in which is my preferred straight pull shotgun you're talking about yeah yeah probably that sulin is is taking the cake so far mm -hmm. um only because it's got the the feel and I, I guess the sturdiness of the real thing like a lot of the a lot of the straight pulls um you know you pick them up and they're, they're just so lightweight you know you just look at it and go oh geez can i actually fire 12 gauge through this um, you know, because you do, it feels like almost like a toy in your hand. It's so lightweight, um, but obviously, you know, they work and they've been tested and everything. But that that Thulin, when you pick it up, it, it has the real weight and everything of of the Benelli. So you've just got that higher 
heavier grade steel in it. It's just, it, you, you can just feel it straight away. So for me, like firing 12 gauge and that, I'd much prefer that than, you know, something that's just that real lightweight feel to it. Um, mm. And uh, yeah, I definitely prefer the straight pull over the levers. I, I mean, I'm not a fan of lever action rifles or shotguns in particular. So yeah, for me, the, the straight pull just makes a lot more sense. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I think I'm yeah I'm right there with you. I prefer the straight pulls over a lever, to be honest. But I think the the cheapness of the Adler, that stamp sheet metal feel, it, you know, they they are the ones that I've used are reliable. I have to admit, yeah. but for yeah. the Adler, but I mean, I haven't oh. branched out into as many uh, variety as, as yourself. They do feel pretty agricultural, though. Yeah. You get a sort of treat of mean. <laughs> oh, yeah. 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 I remember when I, I did the, like, the Admiral, the lever action review, I remember saying, like, my knuckles were killing me from that lever. Like, geez, it was, it was rough. And I know people say that after time it smooths out, but, you know, I'd fired quite a few shells through that that day and it was not easing up on me at that stage um, but then when i did the straight pull ad review i mean i know it was so cheap i think they were 479 dollars somewhere around that at the time i'm doing that review and but you know it was just so much smoother and nicer and you know i was like wow well you know for the price just to be able to get into a shotgun i i, I can't really fold it it hasn't failed me so hmm. um yeah it, it is what it is that reminds me of um, a hunt we went on probably about a year ago and a mate brought his lever action Adler out. I'm pretty sure it's Adler. And, yeah, I used that a few times and just felt it in my knuckles. I'm like, keep using this. It's going to wear away skin. <laughs> oh, so yeah. getting a cord and just wrapping it. Yeah, well, yeah. It. everyone who bought one, the first thing they did was wrap it in paracord. <laughs> 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 I don't know. I could have ran it off a little easier, a little better. <laughs> I mean, that makes slick kit for them, which is supposed to, you know, make it a little, little less harsh on the hands. But I haven't used one with a slick kit personally. But yeah, you don't need it. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> <laughs> anyway, we'll keep moving. Ozzy, what's your favourite movie? Uh, Open Range, Kevin Costner, Robert Duvall. I don't think I've seen it. Yeah, I don't, oh, I don't, I don't think, think I've seen it. <laughs> what, when are we? When are we talking there? Nineties or what? No, it? no, uh, two thousand. Okay. Um, so basically, you know, it's set back in Western times, um, you know, but uh, uh, sort of do the long story short. Um, so uh, Kevin Costner, and Robert Duvall, like they're basically uh, free grazers. So they've got their cattle and their free grazing over land and everything. They come into a little town and uh, the little town's pretty corrupt. The sheriff's run by one of the blokes who owns uh, most of the land around town and everything. And anyhow, they start... Basically, uh, they've got a couple of ranch hands and they start messing them up. And um, But what they don't realise is that Kevin Costner's character in it, um, his you know, ex-army been through uh, the Civil War there and basically what he was hired to do back then was basically be like an assassin for the government um, going around. And he said, we, and he's telling Robert Duvall's character about it at the time. And he says that, um, you know, pretty much we would just go around and we would just uh, terrorise the enemy. But it wasn't long before, you know, basically they were just killing everyone, um, you know, even like women, children, everything, you know, like it was pretty, pretty full on. So you had in the movie, you can see he's got a lot of bad memories with it all. Um, and then these, uh, local guys in this town decide with this big boss to, to rough them up and uh, rough some of the ones up. And, um, yeah, I'll tell you what, like, um, yeah, in, in, in part of the movie, like, um, yeah, I won't spoil the whole movie, but one of the, one of the blokes who had roughed up um, and actually killed one of Robert Duvall's ranch hands, Kevin Costner walks up to his character because he's surrounded by other guys and he says to him, uh, you're the one who shot uh oh, so you're the one who sh uh, shot our friend something like that words like that he said and he goes that's right i shot the boy too and i enjoyed it kevin costas pulls out his pistol and goes bang just shoots him straight between the eyes in front of all these other people and this massive shootout goes on and you know it's a it's 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 an action-packed you know film but what i really really like about that film is the principles in it now i'm not talking about shooting people between the eyes naturally but uh <laughs> but it's uh there's a lot of principles in it and um 
you know, and they they talk about like Robert Duvall's car- character and um, and uh, Kevin Costner's character talk about you know being a man and uh, you know and and a man is only as good as his word and things like to that effect. What they talk about through the film, um, I just like it, eh? Um, so if you haven't seen it, watch it and um, and yeah, let me know what you think. Sounds good. Let's yeah. give it a go. Yeah. Definitely. Definitely not one I've come across, so <laughs> get on it. Yeah. Very good. All right. Next question. Recommend a guest for this podcast. I don't know. I'd, um, I'd probably say uh, in, in the current climate with what you're doing with the bow hunting um, proposals down there is probably be, um, uh, I would say, Graham Park from the Shooters Union, the president. Uh, he'd be probably a good one to talk uh, to you. Um, yeah, he's used to doing a lot of interviews and things like that, and he's pretty much got his finger on the pulse with what's going on. Um, yeah, even in the other states as well. Yep. Yeah. That's a solid recommendation, I reckon. Cool. Well, Josh is feverishly writing that down. <laughs> <laughs> all right. Otherwise, we'll all forget it. Question 10, Aussie, what was your first rifle? Uh, so air rifle when I was you know really young about five six um but then i i soon graduated to obviously one of my favorites the ruger 1022 so that was the first i guess rifle um as far as you know using using powder and not air um and then when i was 11 um my uh my parents bought me an sks and 1200 rounds of ammo for my 11th birthday so uh, Birthday, happy day, <laughs> and that was going yeah. up. You know. <laughs> so, so yeah, you know, and it and it was a funny thing because uh, you know my my uh, old man said to me back then he said you know if you ever do anything wrong with this rifle you'll never see it again and I knew that that accompanied being flogged, um, you know. So um, you did as you were told as a kid, you know, and I, I soon learnt learnt the right and the wrong way, and if you did the right thing all of a sudden you were given a lot of privileges and freedom. So it's like, well, duh, which way would you go? Um, do the wrong thing and end up feeling it on your backside and not getting anything or do the right thing and actually be given all freedom and stuff like that. Well, yeah, do the right thing. So, um, yeah, so I had that, um, you know, and I, I made, even with that, you know, when I was on the farm and stuff, I made sure I had a, a proper backstop and because i was conservative with ammo because i knew that i really couldn't afford to buy it i mean back then it was two dollars fifty for a box of 20 narinco um 7.62 by 39 um uh, fmjs and um you know but even then like i had to work and be able to to buy ammo so um you know i'd make sure i'd have my backstop there and i actually tried to shoot for accuracy you know i wouldn't just get there bang 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 you know that sort of thing um you know but uh yeah i like i really enjoyed that as well um yeah then the slr um as well so um you know most people uh you know most people will be like oh you know a kid with a sks or an slr well no because i had common sense and 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 respect for my elders and people around me and and you know, the furthest thing from my mind was doing harm to any person with that mm. with that rifle. But uh, but I can assure you, when you know your your local mates on the weekend are getting to get it for a shoot, you know, the few tin cans and you know they've got their break action uh, um, you know air rifle, and you rock up with an SKS, it's sort of um, <laughs> it's, it's an uneven playing field. <laughs> I think you put a few mates in the shade. <laughs> <laughs> I remember um, speaking of talking about I like, have kids are different these days. I remember one of my neighbours, he was an old fella, and I mentioned I was a sh- shooter. Yeah. And he was sort of having a good chat about it to me. And he's like, oh, I remember ages ago, I think it was 80s or something like that, 70s. And he just saw this kid walking down with a 22 or just a, a rifle of some sort. He wasn't sure. So he um, paid him to shoot the birds in his trees. So just just how sort of receptive, I guess, the public were. He didn't know the guy. He didn't know the kid. Yeah. He didn't know him. Yeah. But it was just sort yeah. of mature sort of transaction between the two. And, yeah, yeah just that wouldn't happen these days if oh, you had. hell no. no. The culture changed, like, huge after 96. Yeah. Like, everything just changed. Probably for the worst. Knowledge, yeah. I mean, 
you got all that knowledge gone, as you said. You've got a fear now that's been installed into the public over a terrible incident, yes, but um, nonetheless, it was just it was pure fear mongering. Um, I don't think we'll ever get back to that point. Well, well pe- when this is the thing, though, when you know when you had the the newspaper, you know, getting the pictures there of Martin Bryan and you know editing his eyes so they were widened and looking like a crazy man and things like that. I mean, and it's the same when you look at like Adam Lanza and other mass shooters around the world. You know, they always get a picture, and I'm sure there's some bit of photoshopping in it. Um, to get them in a terrible pose, like an evil pose, you know, where they just look like a crazy person. Um, you know, so, so to someone who's on the fence there, well, what does that portray at home? Yeah. Well, that's gun owners. Mm. Um, you know, and, it, and, and that complete different light of how it really is. Um, you know, I had I had at one stage a, uh, a partner who was fairly fairly anti-gun, um, and, and that was through, you know, obviously negativity that she'd seen. Um, and I invited her to come out to a, uh, a pistol shoot I was doing at the range one night. So went out there and, um, you know, and her whole, I guess, outlook had changed because I remember she she paid particular attention to, um, there was a, a two elderly women there. They would have been, mate, they, they would have been probably late 60s, 70, you know, even. And they fired no more than probably maybe one, two mags the whole night. You know, it's a 10, 20 rounds. But it was just that social outing for, for both of those ladies. Um, you know, they weren't there threatening anyone with a handgun or anything like that. And they were talking about, oh, so how's your daughter and your grandkids? Yeah, blah, blah, blah. Just the normal stuff that people talk about. Um, it was just a social outing. Like, you know, and this is the sort of thing, once again, that I, I, I really, really dislike is when people start headhunting us um, to try to taint us with, with you know, with the same brush. I mean, like, for example, like if you had, uh, I don't know, let's say, for example, you know, people um, got uh, a brush and tainted Chinese people say, oh, well, they're all uh, drug dealers, for example, or, you know, they de- deal in heroin or, or whatever. Um, you know, like you, you would be absolutely, you know, hounded from... <laughs> you know from where you live and an outcast um you know and it doesn't matter what it is um you can take any different group um and you can try to taint them with this you know with a particular brush and it's not acceptable Mm -hmm. where the problem lies with all this and i've gone down this with the whole discrimination part is under the anti-discrimination act is you don't have like i mean you've got you know race religion and you've got prerequisites for what you can't discriminate against shooters aren't in there okay there's no there's no uh area where you could say oh that that is applicable to shooters because we're not a uh pre you know we're not a there's there's no prerequisite in there for shooters as a recognized group of people so that's where they can get away with just you know taming us um with whatever brush so where it would have to change in my view would be something along the lines of to say you can't discriminate against a person because of their interest or their sport or something along the lines of that. And then you could, you know, introduce that into that legislation so that it would be applicable for us to be able to fight back on any discrimination grounds. Um, So, yeah, it's a very, it's a very uh, interesting one. Um, And I know that there's people that have said, oh, well, you know, why don't we start our own religion and things like that? Um, I do know of a couple that have tried to do that. Um, And, yeah, they've just got nowhere uh, because you can't just start up a religious group and say, hey, all of us have got to carry AR-15s. Praise the Lord, pass me some ammo. (laughs) 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 It doesn't doesn't work that way. (laughs) It, it is 2022, though. We could all just identify as shooters. <laughs> then yeah. I'll get, like, discriminate against us. Like, <laughs> no, that wouldn't be yeah. accepted either. No, just uh, crack shooter as a gender. Yeah, exactly. exactly. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. It's, it's your pronoun. <laughs> like, yeah. Like, yeah. I, sorry, I had to, I had to say. No, uh, it's a fair point. It's frustrating. At the end of the day, this is the whole thing is just very frustrating. Um, yeah, what mate, it is. You, you touched on before, Martin Braun. What's your take on that? Like, there's obviously conspiracies 
Uh, there's been no inquest into it um, uh, because uh, they don't want to upset the families and, and the people that, that have lost lost people during it. Um, but it seems from the reports and things like this that there is a little bit of something else going on there. Like, is that mm-hmm. – do you have an opinion about that? Because obviously it's, you know, certainly affected your life that incident leading into the um, buyback. Yeah, yeah, definitely. My, my, I guess, frustration with the whole thing is why not put the conspiracy theories to rest? Um, mm. So in other words, if there are these conspiracy theories around, like, for example, uh, one of the, one of the uh, things that I've heard about is, well, it's, uh, you can't take a, a, a guilty plea from someone who's mentally retarded. Um, you know, which he, he was deemed as mentally uh, retarded in the eyes of the law. Um, so, you know, that was one thing that I've heard raised. So if that's the case, well, why doesn't someone say, well, no, under Tasmanian law, this is what happened. You know what I mean? Just put it to bed. So then it doesn't fester and grow and grow. Um, but, I, I, you know, and I've heard other things like, um, you know, the uh, like the rifle that he had, well, a couple of the rifles he had, um, somehow the breaches were blown up uh, in the fire. Um, that's other things I've heard. And I'm thinking, well, you know, like I know firearms fairly well. And, you know, let's let's look at it this way. Like uh, when you pull the trigger and a round goes off, um, that chamber there, um, even though momentarily, is as hot as the surface of the sun. So how is a how is a, a breach or anything like that just going to suddenly blow up in a fire? Um, yeah. You know things like that. So that's that's other stories I've heard. So once again, um, why doesn't someone be quite open with it um, in that position where they go, okay, these are the firearms recovered. You can see here the um, the you know damage it sustained or whatever. So this is where I'm going with it. Like I'm not really a conspiracy theorist, but um, I don't believe they've done themselves any favours by not uh, negativing or, neg- you know, like the conspiracies. Like, why wouldn't you, if there's all these conspiracies getting around, just be very open, accountable and honest and go, OK, this is the reason for this or that. And then it just puts it for, to bed forever. Yeah. Um, and then you'll still have your hardcore conspiracy theorists that will still go down that track, no matter what evidence is presented to them. Um, I mean, COVID, we've seen that uh, with people as well. Um, so I look at it in, in that way, like if it was up to me, um, I would say, okay, let's hear all the allegations that you've got um, and let's put it to bed now and I'll explain why um, each one of those are the way they are. Mm, but yeah. so, yeah, so that's all I can say. I, I, I mean, I wasn't there. I've heard, obviously, numerous theories about it um but just things like that i would i would like to i would like answers for i mean if that's the case if uh you know how do they accept a plea of guilt from a a person without running a trial um you know if that is what happened like i said i i don't know i wasn't there um and you know they they seem to from my understanding they've put like a a um uh, a, what do you call it? A, a, um, a silence on it, where people can't access a lot of the information under freedom of information. Yeah, um, down for another fifty years, I think. Some, somewhere along the lines of that yeah. um, is, is what I've heard. But once again, is that just a conspiracy theory, or is, or is that true? I, I, you know, I don't know. But mm. once again, I'd just like to see that sort of accountability with it. I mean, you know, every pretty much every mass shooter in the world that you see, like, you know, like look at Anders Breivik in uh, Norway or well, what happened there. There was an open court, um, you know, like it was open and accountable. They were filming, you know, they were doing all that sort of thing. Uh, people got to hear evidence. The victims of families got to hear it, uh, that sort of thing. But, um, you know, and then there's other allegations here in Australia that the victims of some of the families wanted to uh, to hear the evidence, they wanted to see the evidence and everything, and they wrote, uh, you know, repetitively to uh, the attorney general at the time, but they were refused. Well, if that is true, um, you know, once again, it's only things I've heard. If it is true, well, once again, why isn't that explained? Why is there not an explanation for that? Um, and if it is true that they've put a silence on things, well, can you blame people for then what 
you know, running down the conspiracy path line. Yeah. Um, when I, I believe my view on it is a lot of that can be put to bed if they just be very open and accountable with everything that took place, just like any other shooter that we've had. Yeah. Um, it, it almost breeds that that conspiracy, as you said, because yeah. they're not transparent. Uh, uh, <laughs> yeah. With uh, I'm not sure how old you were at the time, but I was only eight and I can't really remember much of the change that happened. Obviously, what I know now is what I've read up on and sort of seen as I got older, but yeah, your memories of the change, like with just the general population and their attitudes towards that sort of incident or not incident itself, but the law. Changes. Yeah. 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 I know what you mean. Uh, so, you know, I was a young adult at the time. Um, so I had my own, I, I had my own license. So here in Queensland, it was a, just a credit card license, no photo on it. Um, and there was no expiry date and you could just go in and buy a semi-auto um you know it was just straight out the door with it because you'd already passed that check there to get that license excuse me and that licensing system was working quite well we had it since 1990 that's when the weapons act came out here in queensland so six years prior to port arthur we had that already in place yeah. uh, we didn't have permit to acquire but my view on them is that that's just doubling up there's no need for them if you've already passed the check there to have a license in the first place why do you then need to say mother may i to the government to be able to get something that you're already licensed for that's like giving someone a car license in my view and saying oh before you get a car you've got to say mother may i to the government before we approve you um to me it's just doubling up um so i guess um you know like uh getting back to it how it was changed i remember people of like my my parents era back then um there's there's no uh i guess secret about it pvc uh sold off the shelves people were burying firearms and a lot of them um you know those firearms would still be out there to to this very day uh, there was a group of people who uh, agreed with the new licensing. Um, then there was a group of people who didn't agree with it but followed it, me being one of them. Uh, then you had the other side of it of people who just did not get a new license and they buried what they had. Yeah. Um, but once again, doing that, I look at it and go, well, okay, well, how are you going to go for ammo and everything? Because you've got to go into a, a dealer to be able to show a license and everything like that. So they sort of, you know, my view on that is they, they they were doomed by taking that option um if it was up to me what i would have done back then um because there was a lot of public pressure and opinion on it is simply have the licensing system but why is there a need to then ban semi-automatics mm, yeah. um yeah like you know why not have like if you turned around and said at that time okay we've got this new licensing system in um like, I mean, I'm putting this to you guys to say that was I was the prime minister back then. And I said to you as shooters, OK, we've had this incident. It's a terrible incident. We have a lot of pressure to do something about it. Uh, I don't want to take your firearms off you, but to stop people who are, uh, you know, mentally uh, ill um, or criminals or a danger to themselves or others, I'm going to bring in this licensing system, which requires more extensive background checks. However, feel free to register your your cat D's. You, you're free to have them and keep them. Well, if if, I, if if that was said back then, I'm pretty confident. Once again, speaking for majority of shooters, I'm pretty confident you'd probably have nine out of ten shooters agree and go. You know what? Fair enough. You're being accountable. I can see what you're doing and how you've got to appease different groups and the families who have who have been through that tragedy. Um, but you're also looking after uh my rights as a citizen in this this country and i don't mean a right to bear arms because as we we know that's american but mm -hmm. our right as a citizen to apply for a, a firearm license and, and and to use firearms we have that right here anyone can apply to do it whether you get approved or not it's a different thing so <laughs> yeah but you still have the right to do it we we still see a lot of gun crime in Australia and and post COVID that's that's increased with the whole uh, uh, feud between the Al Alamedine family and and the the other Middle Eastern family and things like that. And there's been quite a number of shootings inside the whole criminal underworld. 
Do you mm-hmm. think that having this, this law change in 96, has that actually benefited us as a country in any way? When you also think about they've they've changed the definition of mass shootings yeah. from four to two as yeah. well. So, so you've got yeah. you've got you've got this law being implemented. We're still having technically now mass shootings. But that that number has considered like continued to drop still, even though they've lowered the number. Well, that's what yeah. I want to ask: is is do you think it's that's actually right. it helped? So I did a um, I did a video on this. Um, if you haven't seen it, it was on uh, the NFA, uh, the failure of the NFA, and I go right through it and I go right into the statistics um, of it. And so it's not it's not my opinions or views or anything. It's simply presenting the facts, and the facts are clearly there. When you look at the the homicide rate uh, with firearms, it was coming down at the same average decline from like 1980 to 96 is what it is from 96 to now. There, there is no difference. The one key thing that the anti-gun groups mislead people with, and I've seen them do this continuously, is they'll claim and they'll say that um, that uh, gun deaths after 96 dropped by, and they'll throw out usually like, they'll throw out a figure like, you know, 70%, 60% or something around, you know, the figure like that. But when, once again, scratch the surface, what they're including in that that gun death is uh, suicide. So yes, and being very open and fair, yes, the the suicide rate with the firearm did drop by a dramatic amount after '96. However, suicides in general didn't drop. So what does that prove? All it proves is someone's going, okay, I'm feeling depressed. I want to I want to kill myself. Um, okay, I can't just go in and get a gun from Kmart. Um, but I'll use another method. So what were the other methods that increased? Uh, hanging, for example, overdosing on pills. And we see that continual increase to this day. So my my uh, argument with that was, well, what did your laws really do? Um, okay, you can beat your chest and say, oh, well, we've reduced gun deaths, you know, and we've done so well. Well, no, you haven't. Is it is it about the life of a person or are you just focused on the method they're using to kill themselves? And that's all that they were clearly parading around was they didn't care that obviously people were still dying. It was just like, oh, you're just not dying from a firearm, so that's a good thing. Our laws work. Well, I, I'm sorry, I disagree. That, that's my view on it. So, um, yeah, I completely disagree with it, and that's what I've found when I've had a look at the stats. And, like, this isn't stats off, like, the NRA website or anything like that. This is the Australian Bureau of Statistics. It's clearly there. Go have a look. And one of the things I found absolutely amazing was the the such uh, little percent of gun homicide and death was due to a semi-automatic uh, firearm. Like they're all bolt actions. The majority, like, were all bolt actions. Mm. So, but they looked at it and go, "Oh, Port Arthur, we've got to take the semi-autos." It's like, hang on here. And just hang on a minute here. Like, are you really concerned overall? Because my view on it is, is if they were really concerned about it overall, they would have banned bold actions as the primary yeah. thing that they would have mm-hmm. tried to ban. Because there was very, very few people, like I said, um, that actually had, you know, like ARs and stuff like that back pre-96 because they were expensive. Yeah. They were really expensive. And um, so, you know, most people would just go for the SKS, which you could, you know, like I say, get for, you know, $250, $300, um, you know, and buy that cheap ammunition. Um, so, you know, it, it represented a very, very small amount having those uh, firearms like AR-15s, SLRs and stuff like that. So once again, it was just, to me, it's just smoke and mirrors. Um, the emotional catchphrase of, you know, gun deaths have dropped by, you know, 70% or whatever percent they want to say, what's that do to the person who sits on the, the fence who's just mum and dad sitting at home? Oh, geez, I'm so glad they did something about the gun laws here in Australia. That's the general response. But then if you break it down to them and actually show them what is represented there on the Australian Bureau of Statistics, they just go, oh, well, that hasn't really made much of a difference. No. No, it hasn't in that regard because people are still dying. To me, it's more about the person's life that's important to how they do it. How they do it is completely irrelevant. Mm-hmm. Yep. So, I think one of the most important points you've raised, Ozzy, is 
you just got to scratch beneath the surface. You can't take everything on face value. It is just yeah. so critical, especially in today's age of the media. <laughs> <laughs> it's just fear mongering and lies basically you really have to do your own research but i think yeah. you know, governments in the media are kind of relying on people just being too lazy to do that yeah well mate i give you a good example this is sort of uh changing and off the top of your firearms but i remember i um i was at home and i just on this day it was a rarity but i, I caught like the midday news and uh, down in uh, South Australia, there was this uh, attack, this dog attack. A dog had attacked a uh, a, a child, teenager, or, or you know something along the lines of that. Um, anyhow, I saw the footage, and it was a Labrador cross, um, something else. It was just a bit of a bitter. Anyhow, they had it on the you know on the pole with the cord and everything, and walking it towards the um, towards the council vehicle. And uh, I remember saying at the time. Uh, to my partner at the time, I said, I bet you on tonight's news, they say it's a pit bull attack. Sure enough. And what, what did they do on the six o'clock news? Pit bull attack. And then they took a stock photo from the US of, it's not even a pit bull. It's a, it's a, it's a fairly well-known American uh, bulldog there. And they've cropped the ears and everything. And it's been on the roids and everything. And it's got its big chain on and everything. And that's what they put up on the six o'clock news pit bull attack in uh, in South Australia, and um, you know, and I'm thinking that is just straight out, that is just fraud, yeah. in my view. That's absolute just fraudulent. So you know, they do that sort of thing, um, and what what does that do? You know, um, it gets that emotion going in people, and they're like, yeah, ban pit bulls, get rid of them. When the reality is, it had nothing to do with the pit bull. And what about the thousands and thousands of people who have those dogs and in a loving family environment, but they just want to take them away because of emotional catchphrase, mm -hmm. you know? And I, I ran a very similar uh, experiment when I had my previous Amstaff Cooper. He was only at the time about sort of, I don't know, 10, 12 weeks old. And I went into a uh, vet supply place to pick up some uh, things for him. And I had him with me. I just had him in my arm, you know, because he was just so small at the time. And uh, there was a older couple in front of me and the woman turns around and she's like, oh, my God, what a lovely puppy. And she's patting him. She goes, oh, what breed is he? And I thought, I'll run a test here. Yeah. And I said, oh, American Pitbull Terrier. And she went, oh, and pulled her hand away. And she goes, why would you want a dog that's going to kill people like this? <laughs> and I just looked at her and I just shook my head and I thought, there's the perfect example. Um, but, you know, whether it's firearms or whether it's animals or, or what it is, I honestly um, would like to ask these people who, you know, soak up all this media emotional catchphrase uh propaganda and just say how do you look yourself in the mirror every day aren't you embarrassed to to just know that you're one of those mindless saps who just gets fed everything mm -hmm. like you know and believes it like it's gospel like you know are, are you that mindless that you, you wouldn't want to actually just do a little bit of digging yourself to see the truth and and i think that's what unfortunately uh, the media rely on is that everybody typically is extremely lazy um, and they're quite happy just to believe the headlines of what comes across on the television and they couldn't, you know, give two hoots about digging any deeper and actually looking at what really went on. It's funny how these days information is so accessible, but mm -hmm. back in the day, information wasn't as accessible, but people were more well versed mm -hmm. in the things that they were around. Mm -hmm. Well, it seemed like anyway. I, was, I didn't live back then, but yeah, <laughs> yeah, yeah. It seemed yeah, like people took a lot more attention to detail with the situations they were involved in or the topics they were sort of, I guess, spreading. I guess, yeah, yeah. yeah. I think now it's just that information overload. Uh, like you say, there's so much of it around, um, so a lot of people will just go, "Oh, yeah, okay, that information's there. I'll get to it later." That type of attitude, yeah. Um, you know, where like even sort of prior to the internet being a common thing, um, you know, people when they got information back in the day, so to speak, um, you know, that was a hot topic. You'd be talking about it. People would be looking into it. Oh, you know, I knew so-and-so who was there and, you know, et cetera, et cetera. Where now it's sort of like, 
okay, an hour later there's more information and now we've got something else and something else and people are just getting overloaded with, with uh, you know, signalling. Um, and I think that's kind of created a uh, negative response in the sense of, if anything, people just go, oh, my God, I just can't be bothered reading that or looking at it. I mean, I know myself, like, you know, like now we've all got iPhones and stuff like that. I mean, how many people send you links to, to things or memes or, or stuff like that, um, you know, and, and you're like, oh, man, I, I'm just, I'm, I'm, my mind's gone today. I just want to put my feet up. I've had enough. But there's just all this information coming in and in and in. So, yeah, if, if you understand what I'm, where I'm getting at with this is that information overload is causing a negative effect where normally if someone was just getting a little bit of information, they'd dedicate some time to look into it. Where now it's like, oh, yeah, another piece of information, yeah, I'm not interested type thing. And I think that's what they're relying on these days to be able to get away with what they do. Yeah. Yeah. And I guess the other point as well, if you actually do go and look, um, especially if you look at gun stuff like for bows, for example, if you searched in Google, that first page in Google would be everything related to just how bow hunting's bad. <laughs> so yeah. you go down like two or three pages to start getting some sort of what well, I would call unbiased sort of reporting. Mm. Well, there's some of the problem holding the media accountable a yeah. little, bit, little bit more. That that would be a, another good start if you were to run for him. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that's right. I mean, and, and, and that's, that's the problem with it. I mean, you know, when you see um, things being reported, um, I mean, and look, I've, I've suffered it. I mean, look what, look what they did a few years ago when they ripped all my footage, you know, Channel 9, The Verdict, and then all the other, all the other channels did it. Um, you know, and I mean, Channel 9 was the worst because they sped up my footage to make that other shotgun cycle a lot quicker and all this sort of thing. And, 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 you know, and it was at that point prior to that, I was fairly, I guess, supportive of media going on. Oh, no, well, they, you know, they just report things. They've got their place and, and their function. But I don't look at it that way. Not now, because I, I was on the, I guess, the blunt end of the stick with regards to seeing how they manipulated things to fill their own agenda. Um, and I tell you what, it's a hell of a wake up call when that happens, because you suddenly realize that the media have their own agenda and they're pushing um, that certain agenda onto the masses. And, you know, you're always taught to believe that on oh, the media, are, you know, they're accountable and they're fair and honest and it's all equal and things like that. Well, that's not certainly uh, what happened with me. Um, far from it. They did everything they could to uh, push for that lever action shotgun ban, and that came from the top down federally. And look what happened. We all copped it, didn't we? You know, every state pretty much it was put from category A to category B, and then anything over five rounds is category D. And as I said when I was interviewed by ABC, uh, believe it or not, uh, I was interviewed on their uh, radio on their drive program. And I said, well, as a feral pest controller, I said, this is how ridiculous it is. I said, as if for feral pest control, I'm going to buy a six round lever action shotgun when under that category D, I can have a, uh, you know, a semi-automatic 223 with a hundred round drum magazine. Like, <laughs> which, which would you go for? Let me think. <laughs> Yeah. yeah, I guess that sort of goes further into like the laws just don't make sense. Yeah, crap. Um, yeah. There's no consistency. Mm. No, no, mate. Yeah. There's, there, there's not. And I think that's the biggest frustration, you know, because a lot of people who have come to my page and who, you know, who have been, I guess, perhaps even neutral or even on the anti side, they, they say, like, you know, what is it that you really want? What are you pushing for? And I simply say, I'm pushing for people to be able to access various categories of firearms, simple as that, um, without restriction in the sense of, um, you know, I find it absolutely crazy that, uh, so this is one of my biggest beefs that I had at the time, and this went to a ministerial complaint um, and still didn't go anywhere. Like they agreed with me and said it was crazy, but then they didn't change anything. So the laws up here as a feral pest controller uh, carrying a Cat H handgun for feral pest control, which I did, um, I had to have the uh, pistol in a holster, which, yeah, fair enough, um, but it had to be concealed by my clothing, right? So 
Um, so I had to wear a jacket or something like that. You know, I'm doing contract shooting. One of the contracts I was on, it was 48 degrees heat. Like, I'm not really keen on wearing a jacket to conceal my, my handgun. But a primary producer that I'm working for on that same property, if he has Cat H for that property, um, he can have that in an exposed holster and walk around all day long with it. Um, no problem. But it's an offence if I don't conceal it yeah. and when it's in the holster. Wow. However... On the other side of it, if I pull it out of the holster, that's fine. I can walk around all day with it in my hands on that property. <laughs> no problem. But as soon as it goes in that holster, it has to be concealed. Otherwise, I commit an offence. Like, you know, so it's, it's, it's things like that that even politicians look at who have no idea about firearms. And, yeah, their words to me was, that's ridiculous. And it's like, yes, Sorry. please do something about it. Um, you know, but... They don't. They don't want to touch it because the media will jump on them. This is their own words to me. The media will jump on them as being pro-gun and they'll lose votes. Yeah, the media is, yeah. As uh, one of our mates said, the media need to answer for what they've been doing, especially over this last five years, really. Can, yeah. It's yeah. like the last 30. I mean, yep. it's, hard, it's hard enough being a law-abiding citizen and a, you know, a licensed firearm owner. But having to remember all these rules and regulations is just this whole other thing on top. And like mm -hmm. obviously yeah. very clearly, Ozzy, how much you sort of know the ins and outs and exactly what you have to do down to that fine detail. Mm -hmm. um, surely that speaks to, you know, the level that, you know, firearm operator or firearm owners have to operate at to just know all these things. And certainly when I speak to people who aren't familiar with firearms and firearm ownership, and they go, oh, you can just do this and this and this. And I'm like, no, actually, I have to do this and I can't scare anyone by, you know, waving it around the place or even when I'm taking it and putting it in my car, like I have to be careful who's around the place and all these sort of hoops I have to jump through. And they're like, oh, really? And I just mm -hmm. think people just don't know. So, I mean, I guess I'm sort of coming to a question, which is how do you think we should better educate people? Is this a thing that should start in schools? Is it... I mean, the media aren't going to take it up. So how, how best to educate the wider community, do you think? And that's the problem. Like, you know, it would be great to start it in schools. I mean, shooting used to be in schools, um, you know, as an actual sport. Um, we're not talking about mass school shootings here, obviously. But, um, you know, the mindset is, uh, is completely changed now. And you'll have most schools who are too afraid to, to take that on because they don't want the heat from, um, you know, from the uh, do-gooder brigade um, who are accusing them of um, basically raising killers at their school. Um, you know, so it always gets taken to a very outlandish level in my view, but um, I think the best way to do it, in all honesty, and that's what I've said for numerous years on the channel, uh, there's a list of things, but the most important thing is to take someone who doesn't have a license not into shooting, take them to a range and, and give them a lick of the ice cream, as I like to say. You take one lick, you're hooked. You know, most people are. Um, if you do it properly, and what I mean by do it properly is when you take someone to a range, take them to a range, show them the fundamentals of shooting, um, you know, some positions and things like that, how a bolt action works. And for God's sake, don't start them on a 308. You know, like, <laughs> like you know, like, like start them on a 22. I don't yep. care if it's the biggest bloke in the world or the smallest frame female in the world, whatever, all the same, start them on a 22. Mm -hmm. um, and then they get the fundamentals and they, they, they're having a heap of fun. Uh, a friend of mine, his wife, like he's a shooter and his wife was, um, you know, hadn't, hadn't shot at all. And he asked me, he said, would you, would you, um, you know, uh, teach her? Um, or, you know, get her involved because she'd probably listen to you. So, you know, we did. We went to a range. And anyhow, she was trembling because, and I said to her, I said, when she was trembling, I sit behind 22. I said, uh, just tell me. I said, um, I said, tell me why you're trembling. I said, be honest, be honest. Um, and she goes, oh, just, I, I am, I'm frightened of guns. And I said, yeah, why? I said, is it the things that you've heard? I said, just tell me. And she goes, yeah, it's just all the stuff, you know, like in the media and things like I just I'm, I'm afraid of them. And I said, no, that's fair enough. I said, I can assure you. I said, after you pull the trigger, I said, with everything I've shown you, I said, you're going to love this. I said, I said, so will you please trust me in that? 
And she's like, yep. Yeah. Anyhow, she pulled the trigger. And she was like, oh, wow, it didn't kill me, you know, like because the kick <laughs> wasn't massive or anything like that. And then all of a sudden she was just having so much fun and she was just plinking away with it, um, you know. And then, only then I'll say to them, you know, if they want to, you can try a larger caliber like a two two three or something like that. But you keep them on a on a rim fire. Um, you know, I mean, you see videos even on, 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 on YouTube and stuff, and it just infuriates me where you see some guys there and they've got a, a girl, like especially their partner, who you want to encourage because if you don't encourage, well, what's going to happen? On the weekend, it, like, they're going to want you to spend time with them and not go out to the range. So it's a no-brainer. Get them involved. And uh, so, you know, but they do. They get them in. They put them behind a 30-odd six. And then next minute, the scope comes back, opens their eye up. And, you know, and they're bleeding everywhere. And the bloke's laughing on camera filming it. Well, what have you done? You've just ruined that woman for life. Like, she won't go anywhere near a firearm. But you do it responsibly. Do it with a twenty-two. Or, you know, even a 22 Magnum, if that's all you've got, you know, one seven eight HMR, just something that's just not going to frighten them. Um, and just get the fundamentals down. Um, that's the first step to be able to do that. Mm. Um, as they get into it, well, they'll learn through the hard, or the school of hard knocks, what the laws are like, because they'll be, you know, subjected to them and treated, um, you know, by the different firearms registries in the way that they do treat licensed shooters. So they'll get to see that. So that'll light the fire in them with regards to voting for the right people. Um, so, you know, that's the next step is once they're into firearms, um, you know, get them to obviously uh, have that interest to go, hey, do you, you know, do you like being treated like this? Well, you know, how about um, you join me and we vote for someone who is more firearm friendly? Um, you know, things like that, um, get people involved. So then uh, if they can on election day, which is extremely important to be handing out um, flyers, you know, I mean, this last election up here or the federal election, we obviously it was down there too, but I mean, it was disgraceful. I mean, I, I was watching the Greens and um, they were targeting young people, like, you know, sort of like about that university level. Um, and they were just in their face with these flyers. But what they were doing to, uh, to the potential voters is they're going, do you want, like, no hex debt? Go to university, completely free, vote for the Greens. That's what they were saying, stuff like that. And, um, you know, and, um, and, and these kids, as I call them, you know, because they're all, like, you know, 18, 19, they are pretty young. Um, and they're going, oh, cool, you know, because they know no difference about any of their socialist um uh, you know, agendas or anything like that. They've got no idea. It's like, oh, cool, no hex debt. That'd be awesome. Yeah. Um, you know, and then uh, we had one one Greens member up here who was a uh, a trans trans woman, I think, was the identification. Um, and, you know, and, and one of the policies was uh, free sex changes for uh, transgender people under the Greens, you know. Yeah. Um, so, so then they were, you know, then they were pushing for all that. Um, but my question to people, who's going to pay for all this? Yeah. Um, <laughs> you know, I, I mean, and, and that's not having a go at their, their policies. I mean, I'd, I'd love to live in a world where everything's free. I would. It'd be awesome. But unfortunately, that's a fantasy. Um, <laughs> it just can't happen. And I mean, I've experienced that living in, in Scandinavia. Um, very socialist, you know, like, um, you know, you pay you start off paying 50% tax on your wage, for example, um, because, you know, there's, there's, you know, your health care is all free. Mm -hmm. So in other words, how do you pay for it? Well, the government taxes you. Um, so, you know, you go up to like 60% tax. You know, one job I had in Denmark, I was you know, paying 60% tax on. So, you know, um, so, you know, people go, oh, it's just so awesome, these countries and that. Like, well, no, it, in some ways, yeah, it's good. But in a lot of other ways, it's not because, Things are not free. The government will always make you pay for things, whether you like it or not. It's the old, it's sort of like the old magic trick, you know. Watch this hand, don't look at this one, you know. And it's as simple as that. But these people just, you know, they they just lap it up. Um, so yeah, you know, that's what we've got going against us politically. So that's why coming back to it, why it's so important to to be politically savvy and on the ball and just. If you can't go and help out for a day, that's fine, but just at least put your vote where it counts mm. um, and encourage other people to do it. 
Uh, also, too, if there's issues, you know, like, for example, with firearms legislation or even like the bow hunting stuff like that. So what should be happening down in South Australia is there should be groups of guys, girls down there in different areas. So say, for example, there's you three guys, hypothetically, I mean, I wouldn't know, but if you all live in the same electorate, well, one of you phone up the local um, member and say, look, we'd like to make an appointment with you. I'd like to come in and discuss a few matters. Um, and then you go in there and sit down and just, you know, and you articulate yourself and say, this is why I disagree with it. I would like your support because so many people say to me, Aussie, oh, what do I actually ask them? Well, it's pretty simple. Ask them for your support. Mm. Um, you know, if you go in there, you can just have a whinge and, and, you know, get it all off your chest. But if you don't ask them to do anything, they'll go, oh, thanks very much for coming down. Shake your hand out the door you go. Nothing else changes. You have to ask them to do something or ask them for support. So, you know, those sort of things are, are extremely important. That is the only way that I can see, um, you know, things actually changing, you know, through education, but also to it's so important. I mean, I do it repetitively every time I go down, I, ha I hand out how to vote cards for various different parties, you know, but the amount of shooters that go off, you know, like, for example, when I was handing out how to vote cards for like One Nation, right? Now, shooters like, oh, Pauline, and they're going off about her. And I'm just going, okay, but my alternate uh, is what? Exactly. People, yeah. people who openly are telling me they want to take my firearms. Yes, is she the nice pro-gun uh, politician? There is probably not, but it is a better option than voting uh, for, say, for example, um, the Labor Party uh, candidate or the Greens candidate who I know are hell-bent on taking what I love away from me. Uh, it's just using your head, but there's so many guys out there that will just go, nah, not voting for any of them, whatever. It's like, hand your firearms in now because you're not helping us. And that is the most frustrating thing. We have one million of us, guys, one million of us in this country, um, include our families or even just immediate our best mates or whatever. We would probably have a voting uh, power of about two million votes. Mm -hmm. That two million votes, if we all voted as one, we could shape any election the way we wanted and we could get the changes that we wanted. But what's stopping us is shooters um, being too arrogant, uh, the infighting, and not voting as one and using our heads. And until that changes, um, nothing will change on the gun law scene, in my view. That's the way I see it. Yeah, very well said. Yeah. Agreed 100% yes. with you, mate. Yeah. Yeah. Um, we are our worst, own worst enemy at times. You <laughs> see the infighting. It's like, what are you doing, guys? Yeah. We should yep. all be on the same team. Yep. It is, mate. It's it's very hard. It's it, it's it's very very frustrating. Um, I mean, I remember. I mean, look, he's retired now, but there was a uh, there was one of the uh, managers for one of the double SAA ranges that um, that I went to many years ago, and um, you know, I, I'd spoken to him about these proposals that the then Labor Party were trying to introduce here in Queensland. I mean, it was insane. I mean, in the proposals was. Um, even cigarette lighters shaped like a firearm were going to require um, safe storage. Um, there was also there was also slipped in there that um, any decision by weapons licensing would be final, and there was no right to appeal through the court process. Um, you know, there was a whole heap of stuff like that. Um, even going to and from a range required trigger locks. Um, you know, it was insane, and and I, I I must admit I fought extremely hard on that to try to get as many people involved in key areas to, to fight back on it. Um, I'm happy to say the only thing that got through was a uh, 15 round magazine limit for a detachable mag on a bolt action center fire uh, or a 10 round for a you know detachable mag on a pump or a lever center fire. That was, that was pretty much all that got through out of all that stuff. And it was a horror. And I, I'd said to this manager, this double S double eight manager at the time, I, I told him about that. I said, mate, what about even the trigger locks? I said, that is just getting worse and worse. What's next? We're going to have to have a safe in our vehicle to, to come out to the range. And, you know, and, and, and his his response to me was, um, oh, you know, it's not that bad. And I'm like, mm. man, and you're not seeing where this is going. Um, you know, and, and, and look, look, this is no dig whatsoever at double s double a people have their own you know thoughts and opinions on various different branches that you know they change from branch to branch on what they support and what they don't um 
but you know it was that's an example of you know he wasn't willing to stand with me you know he was quite happy his view was i'm quite happy with those restrictions and it's like well i'm not because it's not like they're going to get to a certain point and say okay guys it's that's we're going to call it a day now we've we've got what we've got well sorry there is a point that's when they take the last 22 yeah. out of your hands um, and anyone who disagrees with it, as I've said to them numerous times on the channel before, just don't take my word for it. People can call me conspiracy theorist, whatever they want to call me in relation to that. Just look at what's happened since 1996. Once again, if you go into the PM transcripts, it's clearly there on the, on the web. John Howard's words, word for word, on, on when he addressed all of us in 96. And he said, there's no other way. We've just got to get semi-autos. And he even said there, I've heard reports that this is the start of some kind of path to disarmament. This is certainly not the case, ladies and gentlemen, certainly not the case. And I'm here to assure you that this is definitely not the intention of the government. Okay, so what's happened since 96? Let's go through the restrictions. So obviously we've had magazine restrictions for center fire firearms. Some states have got magazine restrictions for rim fire firearms. Um, we've had cosmetic appearance restrictions. Um, you know, WA, I think, is just a complete lost cause. I mean, you know, you get, at, at one stage there, the Savage 110 bolt action rifle, if it had a pistol grip, it was banned. But if it didn't have a pistol grip, it was fine. Um, you know, we had uh, uh, high caliber restrictions, um, you know, where pretty much anything over 308, you, you pretty much have to fight like all hell. I know here in Queensland, they were doing it with uh, like 338 Lapua and so forth. They were treating it like a Cat D firearm where they registered that firearm to a certain property. That was it. You couldn't use it anywhere else. Um, you know, so we've had that. Obviously, we've had all the restrictions there, uh, you know, with pistols. We've had the lever action shotgun ban, so we can't have anything over five rounds there. Um, and the list just keeps going on and on. So yeah. anyone who doesn't believe me, just simply take the time to have a look at the meaning of disarm or disarmament in the dictionary. And it simply means to take firearms or take weapons from a person. So what are they doing? Mm -hmm. It's, it's clearly there, it's clearly happening, but we still have shooters with their heads in the sand going, oh, no, it's not happening. Oh, no, these are only sensible restrictions. The problem is, is there's a pie, and each year they take a piece of that pie. Even if it's just a few crumbs, they still take a piece of that pie each year, whether it's uh, restrictions on the amount of firearms you can have of a certain calibre, which is their new flavour they've been doing for the last couple of years. So if you've got a, a 223 and you want another 223, um, they'll go, hang on, why do you want another one? Mm. Uh, you've already got yeah. one, you know, and there's restrictions there, even though the legislation doesn't say that there's restrictions on, you know, more than one of the same calibre. They'll still do that. So... If that keeps going on, um, and from history since 96, that process continues, where do you think it will end up? There will be no firearms left. Yeah, it's a gradual erosion. It is. Uh -huh. Yeah. It is. Hopefully, because we have social media now, we have, we have a bit more of a voice or the ability to be a bit more squeaky <laughs> and be heard. <laughs> at least yep. to stop this yeah. it should be the case but yeah. i think yeah the the most important thing is being a united front um as ozzy mentioned like we all got to actually be on the same page and present a unified argument it, yeah it's almost got to the point now, now though where enough's enough they've taken what they've taken no more that's it no, no matter uh, you know in my mind anyway it's almost like even if it's a fair point I would probably just disagree with it because they've got enough and what's in place is good enough. Uh, mm -hmm. So I just wouldn't support any more restrictions. And unless we look at it like that, no, enough's enough. You're not getting any more. Well, they'll yeah. keep taking, taking that inch, you know, of the pie or that little yeah. arm of the pie. And then, you know, 50 years down the track, that's it. They've got the whole lot. Well, it's here in Queensland now. We, you know, we've had in the last sort of year, year uh, two years, um, they've been on a, uh, you know, a bit of a uh, rampage with getting cat H off farmers. 
So how they've done it, and I mean, there's no nowhere in the legislation does it say this. All they've done is they've changed their policy. And that's what happens when they can't change the legislation. They just simply change policy and enforce it like it's legislation. So what they did in relation to that is it was clearly for many, many years on weapons licensing homepage, uh, web page there, that you needed a minimum of 500 acres to be considered to have cat H for primary production. That, that was their guidelines. Uh, so what they did pretty much overnight, and I remember at the time I did a big post about it and I got hundreds of people to write ministerials and join me in the fight with that, was uh, they changed it to 5,000 hectares. So went from 500 acres to 5,000 hectares mm. as a minimum, which just cut out how many how yeah. many farmers. Yeah. Uh, I mean, not everyone has 5,000 hectares as a minimum. Um, so then after the ministerials went in and there was a big hoo-ha about it, um, they've then innocently gone, oh, no, we didn't mean 5,000 hectares. We mean 5,000 acres, which is still a, a fair size. Yeah, it's a big jump. <laughs> <laughs> you know? It almost um, feels like that's not right because obviously Queensland, you can get into croc country, you can get into buff uh, uh, mm -hmm. scrub bull pigs. So that just doesn't seem fair. What, you you just got to carry a knife around with you like if you get into a pickle? Yeah, it is ridiculous, mate. I mean, even now, um, you know, and I've, I've said this for years as well, um, but they're now coming after the vet surgeons that have got cat hate up here now so um they're being put through the ringer and the reason that they're being put through the ringer is why because they're saying to various vets oh there's only a handful of you with handguns why what are the other vets doing they don't obviously need them so why do you mm. once again not being united you know even if you even if you uh have little use for a, a cat h as a vet surgeon my view is apply for it and get it because you're entitled to do it under the legislation Mm. Um, and once again, because it, it's it's that old saying, you know, safety in numbers. Why why do you think it's so much harder for them to attack cat A and B because there's one million licensed shooters in, in in Australia that have it, and that's why they go around the fringes and they're attacking things like cat H for farmers, where you know there'll be a couple of hundred. Um, that's why they then attack cat D for feral pest control because once again, a couple of hundred people there, probably in each state. Um, you know, so they, they, they're, they're trimming the edge off the pie. Um, and this is what I keep saying to people. Well, once they trim that edge off the pie, do you think they're going to go, oh, look, we'll just call it a day now. It's all good. We, we won't push for any more restrictions. You know, I mean, I, I saw a document there uh, from one of the uh, federal um, police minister meetings there. Uh, it was about 04, 05 around there. And I, I ended up posting it. Um, and it was their proposals on what they wanted with gun laws. And basically anything that was over one or two round capacity was to go to a higher, uh, was to go to a higher um, category. Um, so a five, 10 shot magazine, you're in cat D. It didn't matter whether it was a bolt action, pump action or whatever. Um, you know, and this is the sort of people that you're dealing with. These people haven't suddenly retired or given up the game. Um, these are the sort of people that, you know, you're dealing with. And like I said, I've seen it firsthand as a uh, licensed shooter. I've been putting up with this for a long time, having had licenses for various different reasons, from primary production to feral pest control. I mean, you know, I'm a collector for every category um, as well. So, you know, I, I've seen the methods and I've seen how they approach it. Um, and my view is that it is completely um misleading and sneaky the way they go about doing it and the ultimate goal is to remove as many firearms as they can from licensed people quick question uh do you think that we could lobby and try to get through uh, and take maybe you could consider it taking back a bit of ground and that's getting semis or the purpose of use for semis uh competition gun shooting do you think that's possible uh in the short term no i think where the next fight is uh this is just my my take on it i think where the next fight is is having cat c for voluntary pest control and why i say voluntary pest control is because currently you know under the various different states is everyone can have 
cat C for primary production or even for feral pest control. That's that's Australia wide. So where the legislation, all you would need to do is change one word to say, you know, for it to include voluntary pest control, because why does it have to be paid? Um, that 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 that's my argument on it. Um, so therefore, it's once again. It's not about the person, it's about the overall goal here. The overall goal is to reduce um, the impact of feral pests on the agricultural industry each year. So give people the tools to be able to do that. So what would it matter if, okay, so I'm a farmer and I say to you, um, okay, I want a hand with you coming out and controlling feral pests. Um, and Let's be honest, the reason why you have semi-automatics uh, to do that in a business point of view as a feral pest controller or a farmer is because on a single encounter, you want to take maximum numbers. You don't want to be there. You're not, you're not there to take a trophy and just shoot one and get a photo beside it or anything like that. You're there to get maximum numbers. You cannot do that unless you have a semi-automatic firearm. And the main reason behind that, and anyone listening to this, this is key information when you're applying for a license for a semi-auto, is because when you've got that semi-auto to your shoulder and you're following that game, your continual side alignment is not interrupted as you're squeezing that trigger. If you've got a manually operated firearm, what's happening, whether it's a lever or it's a pump or it's a bolt, as you're cycling it, you you lose your sight picture on that, on that game. So therefore, semi-automatics are the only option, in my view, for taking maximum numbers of feral pests on a single encounter. Um, and that's why that uh, you'll find feral pest controllers will obviously favour those firearms. So as a, as a property owner, why can't I say to you, okay, I need a hand to uh, shoot feral pests here on the property. Um, I'm not paying you because you're doing it voluntarily, which is going to help the agricultural industry because of the millions and millions of dollars each year it causes the agricultural industry and loss. Um, so therefore, I write a letter to say, yes, you're coming onto my property. It's a rural property. I've got XYZ feral pests. Um, therefore, you can be given a cat seed license for use only on my property because that's where you do the feral pest control. I think there is a, a really strong chance of that happening uh, and getting over the line because, like I say, um, it's the argument of actually doing something for the agricultural industry, but also what are we doing? We're not changing any categories. We're still saying, you know, cat C is still a restricted category for the purpose of feral pest control. But the key change that I would like to see changed is why does it have to be paid? Um, mm. Why can't someone volunteer to go out there um, and, and, and do it properly? Like, for example, if you had someone who was, uh, you know, volunteering at their local um, hypothetical, like Meals on Wheels, right? Like a lot of those people run off volunteers. Well, to me, it's like saying to them, well, no, you've got to wash everything by hand uh, because you're you're not being paid, so you can't have the dishwasher, which makes the job easier. It's exactly the same, in my view, with the firearms. You're already vetted. You're already a license holder. So what's the problem? Why can't you come to me as a voluntary pest controller on my property um, and be able to uh, have cat C to be able to do the job and help out, which is going to help the agricultural industry overall because we basically have an army of licensed shooters who are willing to help completely free of charge. Mm, yeah. Yeah. That sounds like a... <laughs> it makes a lot of good sense good and way. very well spoken, <laughs> I, I think. Oh, just hang on two seconds. Uh, Josh has just nipped off for a quick break. Um, far out. Yeah. It's really good hearing people articulate things the way you do, Aussie. And I think that's definitely something that comes across in your channel um, is you're quite, you're quite well spoken and you can just tell that you know your shit, basically. And yeah, I think thanks, man. I appreciate it. <laughs> Look, it just comes across. You can tell. You can tell when someone's a bullshit artist, or you can tell when they've actually done their research. They spend yeah. their time just completely immersed in the content. And it also sounds like you've said it like a million times. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I've I've had uh, I've had many a debate with numerous different people, and like I'm that's the thing i'm happy to debate anyone yeah. you know on on gun law stuff i mean you know i've had people come to my channel and try to educate me on it all and i'm happy to debate them but the problem is is when they're proven wrong with something well then they default to name calling 
um, mm. you know, and, and, and carrying on like an absolute goose and well, then they just get banned, you know, but then I've just wasted half a day when I could be doing reviews, farm work or whatever else I want to be doing, you know, instead of entertaining some keyboard warrior. But, um, but yeah, many have tried. Um, how, do you, how, do you, how do you go with the comments on your channel? Because as, as I've just as I've just said, you're, you're quite well versed and you're good with an argument, um, but you don't want to sort of enter into you know slanging mashes with people. Do you do you get into the comments much with people? Do you try and answer people, or uh, mate, just... not so much? No, I I, I really I, I've really sort of had to back off in the in the latter years with it because it just takes up so much time. Yeah. Um, I mean, even even questions like you know, like I like I, I can see like on my phones upcoming notifications of people messaging me in the background off the channel, you know, like and they're asking me questions and and they're like, oh, what's your thoughts on this? And you know, and I, I appreciate that that they they think highly enough of me to come to me and ask me for some advice or whatever. But I really try to press upon people. Look, I've had to limit it to people who help me out on Patreon to give you my individual time to help you with the situation. Like mm -hmm. you can look at all my videos completely free and there's numerous hours of information and everything on there. But like for example, if you want if you want me to help you get your license for a certain category, um, I'm sorry, but I've got to be compensated for my time to do that. Um, you know, it's it's a long involved process. The last person that I helped get his Cat D license, it was three months of helping him get that Cat D license. So there's three months of my time. Crikey. So what what did it cost him in uh, in in time? Well, he was a Patreon supporter at 100 bucks a month, so 300 bucks he, he, it was his donation to me. Um, but at the end of the day, it got him over the line with the Cat D license with everything he needed. So, you know, I look at that and I think, well, geez, you imagine if you went to a solicitor or someone like that to even get them to write you a letter, you'd, you'd get charged more than that. Yeah. So I look at it and I think, well, look, fair's fair. Uh, yep. If I went to someone else who was a, perhaps an electrician or something and I wanted, you know, their advice for a few days or months or whatever, like I wouldn't expect them to just be giving me a heap of time for free. It's just it can't work that way so that's where i've limited my uh my time and in, in responding to a lot of comments on the on the channel because mate there's hundreds of them mm. if not all thousands you know i i just can't i mean because i got to the stage where i was sitting down and i was just all day just responding 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 um and i would love to be able to do that I mean, you know, if I didn't have bills to pay and things like that, it would be awesome just being able to go, you know what, I'm just getting up every day and just being able to help everyone. Um, excuse me, but the reality of it is it, just, it can't be done. Yeah. Um, so that's where I say to people, look, you know, um, you can uh, you can donate and just general questions. People like donate a dollar a month and they can ask me questions. I mean, I don't think it's a, much of a trade-off. <laughs> <laughs> no, no, I think that's fair and reasonable. Again, it, it's some of fair and reasonable. Um, yeah, it's it is so time consuming. I mean, we've we experienced it a bit as well. It's just mm -hmm. constant. And when when you post something fresh, and then the notifications start going, you're like, holy crap! How do I keep up with this? <laughs> <laughs> that's only small scale. Yeah, yeah. Um, yeah, and that's it, mate. As it grows, it just gets bigger and bigger, and then you sort of just you don't see all the comments. Um, you know, because you, you can't, you don't have the physical capability in time and, and mental capacity to go through thousands of comments. Um, it's just not possible. Right. I, don't, um, I certainly wouldn't want to get down the path of doing the, the auto responses either no. because it's, people pick up on that as well. <laughs> they just, well, I'm not getting the person. I'm not I'm not getting a genuine answer. So I'd rather have no response rather than yeah. the can response. We'll get back to you and... Yeah, I don't, I don't, and no I response don't. gives you the maybe, <laughs> maybe that <message. laughs> Maybe we'll find time in his day. <laughs> yeah, that's it. It's, I mean, it's, that's the thing. We all we all lead busy lives. Yeah. Um, and you know the way I look at it, like people say, oh, you know, I can go into a gun shop and get free advice. Well, yeah, that's right because the ultimate goal there is they want to sell you something and make some money. Um, you know, and I mean, like I try to be as thorough as I can with the reviews. So if if the reviews don't answer the question that people have and they want more follow-up, um, you know, tailored help, like they're like, oh, yeah, I know you use this rings and these scope, but I want this scope for this, 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 and this. And it's like, well, that's what I do. I've got a group of people who 
uh, are donators on on Patreon, like I say, from a dollar a month. So if that's what they they want to do, they get my individual help, and it's just that way of separating having uh, you know spending the entire day just responding to people and getting nothing else done to where I can go. Okay, because uh, it's a smaller amount on Patreon, well I can spend you know an hour each day just responding and just helping those guys out who help me in return, and that's all it is. Mm. For sure. Well, hopefully a longer format chat with us can help answer some some random questions that are out there for people. <laughs> <laughs> we do have to say a big thank you. Now, in terms of hunting, do you get out recreationally to hunt or is it mostly pest control for you? Uh, a lot of pest control, although at the moment I've got uh, I've got a heap of deer. I'm, I'm actually yet to release the footage because I actually got it on my, my good Sony camera. Oh. Um, and the reason why I didn't take a shot is because, believe it or not, I had uh carpet cleaners <laughs> turn, turning up here and uh and it was like they were like half an hour away and i'm thinking okay if i shoot one of these deer like i don't know which one of the workers from this company are coming and i'm thinking to myself like that's the last thing i need is have this deer strung up butcher and it is they're, <laughs> they're coming up the you know coming up the driveway to a rural property they possibly not been to before they probably think it's a scene out of wolf creek or something so i, I sort of <laughs> aired on the side of caution with that one and thought no I'll, I'll i'll leave them for another day so you know that sort of thing mate i mean that obviously a class is feral pest but i see that as a recreational thing too to be able to harvest meat yeah. um you know i mean the pest control part is dropping them but the recreational part is uh, obviously harvesting the meat and enjoying cooking with the meat and stuff mm. um yeah i find like uh i mean it's once again per feral pest control again like going out with hank and getting a few rabbits well, well hares mainly um there are a couple of rabbits here and there but um hares mainly and um you know and then i, I cook that meat up for him and stuff and things so kind of recreational mix with you yeah. know with with the, the the work of feral pest control yep. so it's just a different environment i mean i, I went down to went down to Adelaide there, oh, I don't know, maybe about eight years or so ago now. And uh, it was with uh, Rusty, who was doing Southern Shooters at the time. It you know, does that impact dynamics now. And, and I was going down there and doing a, basically help running a hunting course and talking about setups and just, you know, how to hunt different game and things like that. And uh, the funny thing was, I, I went down there and I said, you know, the one thing I, I can't stand, I said, is these people that have got these like heavy barrel rifles, you know, and they got these big magnification scopes and everything. I said, they're not real hunters. Like anyone who hunts and shoots on the shoulder will have something lightweight, you know, a lower magnification scope. And I, I said, all right, so pull out your rifles. Everyone on the course had a heavy barrel, the massive, a massive optic. And it was just you guys in South Australia, like because you're hunting down there as like a lot of like foxes and shooting like two, three hundred, you know, away at foxes yeah. and stuff. So, you know, that varmint type setup is quite, you know, popular down there. Yeah. And I'm just going, oh, my God, you know, and even now if I if I if I talk with the boys there, or even, you know, Sean from STS Targets, like, you know, I talk to him now and then, and, you know, I always have a crack and just say, you know, like you guys with your heavy barrels, there should be a sign at the border when you come across <laughs> saying, you know, you, you know, like if you, if you haven't got a, uh, you know, if you've got a uh, rifle that weighs under five kilos, go home type thing, you know, like, cause... <laughs> this is heavy barrel country. <laughs> oh yeah, exactly. He heavy barrel country through and through where, you know, up here, mate, it's completely different because we've got so many pigs up here um things like that where really you you're walking through bushland and everything you want something lightweight to obviously lug around but you want something lightweight that's going to come up to the shoulder and you can mm -hmm. you know be able to shoot off the shoulder fairly quickly with and everything um you know we're obviously a heavy barrel like a ticker a1 tack isn't going to be your choice to walk around with up here uh, yeah josh has tried it <laughs> <laughs> for a while <laughs> Yeah. Yeah. Well, it saves, it saves on gym membership, put it that way. <laughs> <laughs> no, no, it doesn't. <laughs> <laughs> no, I put a light and got a Seiko, actually, so a little A7 rough tech, so that's a little bit lighter on the, <laughs> on the shoulders. <laughs> yep. <laughs> hey, Ozzy, is there a sort of dream hunt or destination for you that still exists? 
Not really, mate. Eh? Um, to be honest, like the feral pest control pretty much covered a lot of stuff. Yep. Um, you know, I'm not the sort of person, I mean, look, I, I know that I probably caught flack for this, but yeah, I'm not the sort of person that I, I, ne- I never have a desire to go to Africa and pull the trigger on an elephant. You know, it's just not me. Um, I understand there's different, you know, conservation and different programs over there that probably allow that and all that sort of thing. But just a personal thing, I'd, I'd love to go on a safari over there, but I'd take my Sony camera and get some different photos and things. That's, that's just me. So I don't have a, I'm not a, uh, I'm definitely not a trophy hunter yep. um, by by any means. Um, when I hunt something, there's there's two main purposes: either feral pest control, um, but even then, I like to use the meat. Um, mm. So yeah, that's that's sort of my own. That's I guess my own inner personal ethics on it. Yep. Um, you know, and I'm not against people who obviously go away hunting and and do those sort of things and go on safaris overseas or whatever. Like that's that's their thing. But uh, yeah, just me personally, um, I, I don't. It's not something I'd ever really want to do. Um, same too, like I'd never, I, I, I can't say that I would ever have any interest in going overseas and shooting a bear. Um, you know, that's just not my thing either. Um, you know, and obviously in uh, some of the Nordic countries and stuff, you know, like there's ice bears and stuff like uh, up in the north there. Um, mm. Same sort of thing, mate. I, I That just wouldn't interest me at all. Um, I'm the sort of person that, like, I like to bring the balance back in nature. I like to remove animals that aren't supposed to be there. So, in other words, like the feral pests. Uh, but I also enjoy, like, uh, I guess, hunting in the sense of I'm actually going to eat the meat. So, yeah. for me, I'm not going to eat ice bear or, <laughs> or brown bear, for that matter. Um, and I'm certainly not going to be eating elephant or anything like that. So, for me, there's just no interest there. Yeah, no, fair point. I mean, a lot of people will resonate with that and that's the beauty about hunting as well. You can sort of choose your own adventure with your personal preference as well. So yeah, that's cool with us too, man, for sure. Um, and I think the most important thing is you're actually utilizing that meat. And for us, that's number one. Um, yeah. You know, anything yeah. we, unless it's you know, a fox or something like that, you know, if we're shooting a deer, then straight away we're in butchering and the, the work begins. So yeah. yeah. Well, it's, it's premium meat. I mean, you know, like uh, – I've often said to people, look back at, you know, the times in, in uh, medieval England. I mean, peasants were prohibited from, you know, shooting the, the deer because why? It was the meat of the king or the queen. Mm. Um, you know, it was royalty meat um, and for good reason because it tastes damn good. Um, <laughs> you know, so, uh, so yeah, so I see it as a, a real, it's a, it's a real good thing that we've got deer here in Australia. Um, I think personally, uh, from even a feral pest control point of view, I think it'd be probably a sad day not to see any deer roaming around here in Australia. Um, mm, you know, great. I know numbers need to be limited, and I've certainly shot plenty of deer from a feral pest control point of view. Um, and I understand like the impacts they make, um, in particular to like you know different like uh, cropping farms and things like that. Um, but yeah, but just in general, I mean, I'd, I'd hate to see them completely eradicated, I guess, um, because I know that they can offer a sustainable meat source for a lot of people. Mm-hmm. Definitely balanced there. With that, adding your contract shooting, would you say that most of your target species would be pig up there? Uh, wild dogs. Wild dogs. Oh, wow. Yeah, ah. wild dogs. Um, they are out of control here. Um so uh, I, the the highest I've seen in one pack is thirty six dogs. Um, right. So um, yeah, in one place I was contracted to, they were losing a fully grown beast every three days. So um, yeah, so like I'm talking a fully grown, you know, steer, like every three days. Holy moly! So you need, oh, a, yeah. need a hand up there, or <laughs> <laughs> so, but like, mate, I, I thought originally, I thought. I honestly thought the property owners were perhaps talking it up a bit just to try to prioritise me going out there. Um, the uh, the dogs were that bad; they were attacking the farm hands as they rounding up cattle on their uh, motorcycles. Um, they were coming roaring out of the bushes and trying to rip them off the motorcycles uh, because they're Alsatian cross, like German Shepherd cross type, um, you know, dogs. And um, yeah, they they've got some mongrel in them, that's for sure. Uh, 
and uh, they have no hesitation in attacking you and coming for you. Um, the farmer's wife there, she was too afraid to walk to the front gate and back for exercise, which she used to do on a, you know, each day. Um, and uh, they were getting that bad. They were coming in and they'd ripped apart a number of the farm dogs um, while they were tied up. So, um, you know, it was pretty bad. And when I went there, uh, so it was a couple of thousand acres and uh, not only was there one pack, there was um, six individual packs and each each pack ranged between 31 and 36 dogs in each pack. So um, and that's how much was on just this one property. So, you know, when, when you look at that, um, it's a complete different ball game to just some idle dingo wandering around some rural property. Um, you know, and that's why I used to uh, always carry a handgun with me um, as a backup. Uh, so, you know, I'd have like my, my primary firearm being like the Ruger SR556. Um, and then I'd always have a handgun as well. There was twofold. One, if I did have any problems and I had to go to the handgun, whether I'd be in like, you know, just a confined scrub or whatever, I had that option there. But number two is, you know, if I had basically winged an animal and it was still alive well then i can walk up with a 22 round for you know 10 cents and and put them out of their misery mm. um where you know why would i go up and then waste another 223 or 308 um you know it's because it, it is it's about making money that's why you're doing it you're not you're not out there doing it recreationally so um so yeah so that was sort of the twofold approach there but uh, mate i've had them attack me um, you know, I was thinking about that when you asked me about the, some of the most dangerous things I've, I've ever done. Um, wild dogs did come to mind, um, you know, because you can't negotiate with them and go, oh, OK, look, I give up, I'll leave the property. I mean, they want to rip your, rip your throat out. Um, and, you know, when they're like that, there is only one firearm that you should have, and that is definitely a semi-automatic uh, rifle or shotgun. Um, you know, you start dropping a few in the pack the others get discouraged fairly quickly um, but the thing is you've got a handful of them that are coming for you at full pelt and want to kill you so um, you know it's it's an issue so that's probably one of the biggest problems up here is wild dogs um, here on my property um, I mean there was a lot when I when I first uh, got this property um, a lot and uh, that that was basically managed and thinned out through the use of Cat C firearms. Um, you know, I was able to obviously be here, and then when, well, my old dog Cooper, he used to alert very well to wild dogs. So, you know, my new dog Hank. I mean, he he's learning the ropes with that because he's still you know, fairly young. Um, but I can, you know, if I'm here at the time, um, well, I can simply grab a, you know, usually I grab the Benelli. You know, and I'm chasing them through the scrub with that, and it, it just does the job. Um, you know, but you've got to have those firearms to be able to continually manage the problem. Because if you don't, well, what happens? You come across the pack, so you've got a bolt action two to three. Fire the first shot, and you, you're racking the next one, and then trying to get on target again because you've lost that um, side alignment uh, through the sheer nature of manually cycling that action. Um, then you're trying to get back on track with it and the dogs have scattered. Mm. So, um, you know, that's where you need a semi-automatic, preferably like I always have is with a red dot because why? You're engaging them at that those typical hunting distances, which is 75 to 125 yards um, and, you know, sometimes a lot closer. So you need something that isn't obviously 24 power scope. Sorry, South Australian shooters, but um, <laughs> you know, and, and you've got to be able to, you've got to be able to engage and and line up those those dogs to take maximum numbers in that single encounter. Because this is a problem with dogs; they're very smart. Is um, whenever I'd go to a property, I'd always walk around the property to start with because the dogs had not smelt my my smell yet. So they didn't associate my smell with anything. So I could actually walk up on them. Um, once you kill them, even if it's just a couple in the pack or whatever, um, it's like the bush telegram goes out. They've told every dog on that property what your smell is and you will not come across them by walking up on them. Um, so what I've found is that's when you've got to do a combination of calling 
um, and also use like uh, baits, but not 1080 baits. I'm talking about attracting baits. Like, um, you know, there was a bait I used, um, like a dog in heat urine, and it had a bit of skunk in it and everything like that. So it's an attractive bait. It doesn't kill them. They can come up and lick it and eat it, but they're not going to die. But it's just to bring them in so you can shoot them. Because uh, once again, coming back to being an animal lover, like I don't, uh, I don't agree with them suffering. Um, you know, I, I like to put them out of their misery with a couple of shots very quickly, quick succession, and then that's it. Lights out, it's done. Yep. Um, you know, once again, the dogs are doing what dogs do, what they've been doing for thousands of years, yeah. getting in packs, taking down, you know, different animals and, and surviving. So I see it as my job as a responsible uh, shooter to get out there and euthanize them as quickly and painlessly as possible. Mm. 100%. Very good. I'm still stuck on uh, taking down a thousand pound steer. <laughs> <laughs> oh, that's a, yeah, mate. That's yeah. like I've, I've seen videos of them taking down samba in in or probing samba in the high country, but I mean mm-hmm. taking down a, a whole cow. That's like next level. And once they've done it, that's it. You know, they're pretty mm-hmm. clearly after oh, yeah, that. Once they learn, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so they know exactly what to do. <laughs> yeah, that's it. And and that's the thing with wild dogs is usually like you try to keep them the levels down uh, to about sort of five or under in a pack. Um, once they start getting more numbers from there, they get obviously, you know, it's like that old saying, pack mentality. And it's so true. Like the dogs get more bravado about them, the bigger the pack. And then when you start getting packs of 20 plus dogs, that's when you've got a real issue on your hands because those things will just monster most animals and just like these i I saw it on my own eyes Uh, you know they just monstered this steer and they were just they were eating it before it even hit the ground they were ripping chunks out of its out of its uh legs and underneath its belly and stuff like that just into it um, Mm. because they had the numbers they just it was like ants over this damn thing and uh you know and and you know, there's no way in hell I would walk up to those dogs and try to take them out with a uh, a bolt action two to three. Like it's just suicide. Mm. Um, you know, um, yeah. So th- they're a, they are a very big problem here in uh, Queensland, especially southeast Queensland, because there is that availability for them to breed and recruit domestic dogs. Mm. And what I mean by recruit domestic dogs is I, I I've seen this with my own eyes once again. I saw a pack of dogs run through. Uh, a housing estate, a rural housing estate, and they've got very much. They sound a lot like coyotes when they're going off, and um, they were they were making all these noises, and um, and there was different domestic dogs jumping fences and running out of yards and joining the pack and running off with them. <laughs> Bloody cold <cool to> arms. <laughs> yeah. Hey, yeah, like I, I thought. I remember at the time saying, like, people will not believe me, like, and I saw it with my own eyes. <laughs> and I've just gone, these buggers are, are next level smart, you know, yeah. and that's what they were doing. So, yeah, even very, with, very uh, big problem. Sorry, mate. Even with a semi automatic, I'd find it would still be quite hairy dealing with like a 30 odd pack of uh, dogs. What sort yeah. of the, how close have they got to you when doing that? Uh, so I've had one jump at my face and I've shot at midair. <laughs> Holy crap. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, fucking hell. Fuck no. yeah. So, uh, and mate, when when that's happening, and that was an Alsatian cross, uh, I tell you what, it's a whole new level. Like you just go and you're thinking about your choice of occupation. Yeah, yeah. I'll bet. Going, wow, is this really this... worth it? This is insane. And, yeah. um You know, and that and that's the thing. Like, um, especially if they've got, um, you know, especially if there's a bitch in heat. Mm-hmm. Um, you know, in the pack or there's pups on the ground, um, the aggression level just goes right up. And, um, yeah, and that, that's why, mate, I've you know, always carried a handgun, um, you know, when doing the feral pest control there because, you know, you go down, you fall down or whatever, or you can transition to it and use that to obviously, you know, be able to, um, you know, shoot more of them. But as I said... Usually you'll get a couple of that will be very brave and then others will scatter. Mm. But then you can have just that few more that may be just brave and go for you at the same time. And that's when you want to make sure you've got the right equipment to, to make sure that you're safe 
as well because let's be honest like feral pest control is a business you still have to adhere to workplace health and safety laws and legislation so i my view on that is having a bold action is not adhering to the law that would be like saying to a builder well here's a here's a hammer go build a house you're not having a a nail gun you know you do it all manually and take your time you know um well no it just doesn't work in this day and age and i see shooting as exactly the same as well from a business point of view you need to have the right equipment to do the job um, otherwise you're just not going to make an impact and that's why you know when there's articles released and i put it on my facebook page and i just say i've got the solution give shooters the right equipment and you've got an army of shooters who will eradicate the pest control problem for free like you know and it's as simple as that like you know like i say it brings it back to that voluntary pest control yep. get people out there with you know like cat c shotguns and and cat c rifles like a good semi-auto 22 magnum for example there's a lot of things you can do with that um and get get them out there eradicating the foxes eradicating the uh, you know the rabbits the hares um you know wild dogs and, and all that sort of stuff that they could easily do with a cat c firearm um, and then we can actually see some change and work together. But I just, I don't get it. You know, it's like, well, it's not like it, it, it's how it is. They just don't want to work with us mm. because they do not want to acknowledge, this is my take on it, that shooters could be a possible solution because that's a positive news story and they don't want that. Yeah. Wow. I mean, I can't speak for the other boys, but I certainly didn't know the wild dog problem was that bad, like packs of 30 around the place. So. Mm -hmm. Far out. Cheers for the insight. I'm, I'm yeah. six packs of thirty. Yeah, six packs. <laughs> six. Yeah. six. Yeah. That's mental. Jesus. Far out. Yeah. Yeah, mate. I tell you, when you're walking around in the darkness, um, and you can hear, like you know, you can hear the howling all around you and stuff like that. Like, uh, and they're coming closer because you're calling them in, um, and and everything's just dark, and you're just waiting for a silhouette on the horizon or something like that to be able to see them um i tell you what like because you, you know you don't want to spook them with light so you wait till they come in and then you light them up and i tell you it's it's pretty uh it's pretty uh ass puckering <laughs> <laughs> i bet i bet sounds like you like need a belt fed 50 cow <laughs> yeah yeah well i, I tell you what it's, it's a big uh, one yeah yeah it mate it is it is that it is really bad up here the wild dog problem i mean I, i've got wild dogs continuous so i've got another two three that are coming through i pick them up on my trail cameras because i've got several of them you know around my property and um so it's good i know where the feral pests are when they come through and so they've started raising their head up again but you know i'll be able to take care of it because I, i've got the right equipment to be able to do the job effectively where if I go and just shoot one, well, the next of them, just they just escape only to breed up the next season. And then the problem just continues to explode um, where, you know, you walk up on them with the Benelli and you've got like, you know, like five or six shots, one up the spout, you know, well, you can take a few dogs with that and you can actually make an impact um, mm. and control those numbers. And without it, I, there's no way I would have those numbers controlled to the degree that I have for the last eight years of being on this property. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Well, I feel like, uh, Aussie, we could keep talking to you <laughs> the entire night, but I think it's probably time we start getting towards wrapping it up with you, mate. We've been chatting for Too a while. Easy. We have to say a big thank you to you for your time. We have to ask, what's next for the Aussie Reviews channel? Uh, so I've, I've been trying to organise one of those Bushmeister uh, shotguns, the lever release ones that are, are really like crazy popular at the moment. So I've, yeah. I've, not, I've not seen one. I've not picked one up. Um, but uh, at the time of doing this, I should hopefully get one tomorrow. Um, so we've had a big problem up here with PTAs. Like I'm talking people waiting four or five months for a PTA to be approved. Um, and, and there was figures like, you know, 30, 50,000 PTAs behind that they hadn't processed and stuff. So there's been some terrible delays. So the last couple of months for me, um, you know, I've sort of done, well, it's been good because I've been able to review some of the other products that I've wanted to review and do a, a couple of particular ammunition reviews, that sort of stuff. Yeah. But yeah, it's because of the hold up with PTAs and all that sort of stuff. So um, yeah, so I should hopefully have that Bushmeister tomorrow. 
um, and then it'll be a matter of just, well, the next five days is <laughs> set to rain here, so I'll have to wait till that's over, and then uh, and then hopefully be able to review it from there. So I've got that. Um, I've also got a Australian Australian made gun cleaner uh, that I'm looking at. I've got to review that. It looks promising. Um, and the fact that it's made here, I mean, everyone knows that I love G96. I've been using it since the 90s. So, um, you know, I've, I've had no need to go elsewhere. But when I found out this stuff is supposed to be better, but also made here, I'm a big supporter of that, you know, um, provided obviously that it's it's quality. I mean, if it, if it doesn't work and doesn't do the job, I, I don't care whether it's made by my own parents, you know, it's not going to get a favourable review, um, <laughs> you know. Um, so it's got to it's got to perform, um, which I'm confident it will, um, which will be great because it'll be another option on the table for for shooters here. Because as we all know, everything is getting so hard to get from the US, and I think at the time of doing this, we're down to like 62 or 61 cents US. So everything from the US is going through the roof. So I think it's a great time for a lot of Australian businesses to step up to the plate if they've got a great product to offer. 100%. Agree there. Yeah, agree. And uh, how can people find you and your channel and all your social media handles? Yeah, mate, just Aussie Reviews. So A-double-Z-I-E um, Reviews and just put it into Google. It actually does come up. They haven't <laughs> they haven't hampered me that much yet. So, uh, yeah, it'll come up. And uh, probably after you get through a few negative stories or whatever, um, you know, they'll, they'll try to throw something up there. But uh, you'll eventually get to the YouTube channel or you can go to, like, Facebook, uh, you know, we're on Instagram. Even uh, I've got like AussieReviews.com and .com.au. So should it happen one day where YouTube just asks me or whatever, then I've still got a website where everybody can come and, um, you know, be able to see videos and stuff like that. Yeah. So. Excellent. Awesome. You got, boys got any more questions for Aussie? Just a huge thank you. Yeah. Um, yeah. It's been it's been an honour and a pleasure to have you on. Yep. Yeah. Mate, I to... appreciate it. Yeah, we've we've learned a lot, and I'm sure our listeners will get a kick out of hearing you in a sort of a longer format than, <laughs> than uh, what they're used to. And it's been really good getting to know you as well, and learning a bit about yeah. your story and and how you started with things and your journey. Mm-hmm. And yeah, man, it's uh, it's been an honour, and we have to say a really big thank you. Yeah, yeah. Hey, hey, appreciate it. Maybe one day we can catch up for a beer or something if we're if you're in SA or, well, yeah, <laughs> yeah, well. Hey. Or if you're up here, and I can take you out and introduce you to a few wild dogs. <laughs> that actually, actually sounds like a lot of fun. Yeah, we'll, we'll, we'll see how good your South Australian bow hunting is then. <laughs> uh, well, we'll have any battle men here. Yeah. So. <laughs> <laughs> take it from a rain. Uh, <laughs> sounds like a plan. All right. Well, we'll leave it there, Aussie. Big thank you, and uh, yeah, tune in again next week for another episode of Centre Mate Podcast. We'll catch you later. Yeah, thanks. Gotcha. Gotcha.